Right, thank you for that. We now move on. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Offshore Petroleum Licensing Bill, second reading. Now. The raised amendment in the name of the Leader of the Opposition has been selected. Minister, to move the second reading, I call the Secretary of State. Uh, could, oh, no, is it the Minister? I'll oh, continue. Secretary of State. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move that the bill be now read a second time. Britain is the first major economy to halve its emissions. That is an incredible achievement. How have we done this? We have increased our renewable electricity capacity fivefold since 2010. Nearly half our electricity comes from renewables now, up from 7% in 2010. And just two weeks ago, I set out the largest nuclear expansion for 70 years. Yeah. And going forward, we continue to have some of the most ambitious climate change targets of any major economy in the world. Yeah, yeah. Here in the UK, we are committed to reducing emissions by at least 68% in 2030 from 1990 levels. Where is everybody else? The EU is committed to 55%, having recently rejected a move to 57%, and the United States is just at 40%. It is clear that when it comes to climate change, we can be very proud of our record and the work that we are going to do. We have managed to achieve this whilst acting to help families with their energy bills. We stepped in to help families struggling with energy prices after Putin's invasion of Ukraine, and our total support for the cost of living stands at £104 billion, a package which is amongst the most generous in Europe. Last year, we passed the Landmark Energy Act, which lays the foundation for a cleaner, more secure energy system. Our changes to competition, to managing energy consumption and incentivising investment in new technology will mean billions in savings for consumers as we work towards net zero. We have overseen a huge increase in the number of homes which are energy efficient from 14% in 2010 to close to half today, and we are investing more over the next Parliament to continue this important work. Uh, I am very grateful for the uh, Minister for giving way, and she paints a very uh, rosy picture, particularly when it comes to renewables. So why is it that your own, the Minister's own energy czar has resigned in protest? Well, I thank the Honourable Secretary State. Uh, we don't actually have an, an energy czar, but we have an energy secretary of state. And let me tell you, I respect the honourable member for Kingswood. I wish him well in his next job. But if the thing that you care about is making sure that we reduce emissions, the question that everybody in this chamber needs to answer is why would you want to import fuel with higher emissions from abroad? Now, we are investing in more renewable energy. We are starting a nuclear revival. We will support new technologies like hydrogen, carbon yeah, capture yeah, and fusion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And this is our plan to have a balanced energy policy. However, we need to make sure that the transition works for British public and the British economy. Our plans can't be based on ideology. They must be based on common sense. Even the Climate Change Committee's own data shows that when we reach net zero in 2050, we will still be using oil and gas for a significant portion of our energy. And that is because it is not absolute zero, it is net zero. Yes. In other words, while our use of oil and gas is going to rapidly diminish, we will still need both for decades to come. Our bill will improve our energy security and the energy security of yep. Europe. In the last two years, Europe has had to wean itself off Russian oil and gas. We have responded by tripling gas export to the continent, and we were a net exporter of electricity to Europe in 2022 for the first time in more than a decade. Yep. We do not live in a world where we can simply turn off oil and gas. Is she saying? that the only licences the government intend to issue are for those for uh, gas and oil that are destined for the British market. Well, I thank okay. the Honourable Gentleman. I'm glad that he raised this question because I know that the Labour Party have been spouting an awful lot of nonsense when it comes As to this usual. area. Yeah, In the UK, Same we are way. blessed with a geological gift that is the North Sea. It's an incredible national asset. And the gas that is produced there Virtually all of that gas goes straight into the UK gas transmission network, and that is equivalent to about 50% of our overall gas needs. When it comes to oil, 90% of what is um, refined abroad is refined in Europe. We are a net importer overall. And the question that I think the honourable gentleman should answer is: If Europe did not get that oil from the UK, where would he like them to get it from? From Russia or further afield? And 
And this is the question at the heart of the bill. We know that we are going to need oil and gas. Where do we want that to come from? Only an ideologue would argue that we are better off importing dirtier fuels from abroad rather than using what we can produce at home. But it is not just energy security that dictates that we should use our own resources. The economic case also shows that introducing annual licensing is the right thing to do. And, w- and, and would she accept that despite the way in which some members of this House have tried to rubbish the idea that you, uh, having our own oil and gas doesn't mean any energy security for the UK, 88% of the gas which we extract at present actually stays in the UK. Do we, would we prefer to import that? Well, I thank the gentleman for making this point. Not only is it better for energy security, but gas that we bring in from abroad through LNG has four times higher emissions. So if you care about the environment, then you should back this bill. Domestic oil and gas production adds about £16 billion to the UK economy annually. It brings in tens of billions of pounds of tax revenue. And to give an example of how this has helped support families with the cost of living, last year we raised £9 billion in tax revenue from the oil and gas sector. That is money that we can use to support families like we did last winter, paying half the average family's energy bill, which roughly amounted to £1,500 per household. I am going to make some progress. If we had no oil and gas sector, then £9 billion more would have fallen on taxpayers' shoulders. And why should we forego this tax revenue to other countries? What possible benefit could the British public feel from billions of pounds in tax revenue that could be raised here being sent abroad, all to import fuel with higher emissions? And now let me turn to perhaps the most important reason to back this bill, the work as I will in a moment. There are 200,000 people supported by the sector in communities like Aberdeen and Grimsby and those in the north-east of England, 93,000 people in Scotland, over 10,000 people in Yorkshire and the Humber, 14,000 people in the north-west. I am grateful to her for giving way. She will know as well as I do that most of our gas that we import comes from Norway, where gas production is half as polluting as it is in the UK. So let's not have all of this nonsense about imports being so much uh, higher carbon intensity, because from Norway they are certainly not. And secondly, will she accept the fact that most of the emissions are actually produced when we uh, consume the oil and gas, and therefore will she start looking at scope three emissions, not just the production emissions, which are not the greatest emissions in question? Well, I thank the Honourable Lady you know, for her question, but I think her question fundamentally misunderstands the energy market because when we cannot get Norwegian gas, when we cannot, we've made the most of all of our gas. What is the marginal gas that we use? It is LNG, which has four times higher the emissions you know than what we can produce here. You produce less UK gas, you need more LNG. Not complicated. Coming back to what I think is a really critical part of this bill is the workers. A recent report from Robert Gordon University found that a faster decline in our oil and gas sector, which the opposition is proposing, could halve the workforce by 2030, leading to a significant loss of skills for the future energy sector. Because, Mr Speaker, these are the workers whose skills we will need for our future energy production. The same report found that over 90% of the UK's oil and gas workforce have skills that are transferable to the offshore renewables sector. However, if we do not manage that transition correctly, and everybody here agrees that we do need to transition, then we will lose those very important workers and their skills, because it is the same people who are working on oil and gas rigs today that we will need on the offshore wind farms of tomorrow. Our subsea installation engineers who lay cables our technicians who remotely operate subsea vehicles, yeah, yeah. our divers, project managers, yeah, yeah, yeah. engineering specialists servicing yeah, yeah, yeah. our offshore rigs. These are all essential oil and gas jobs yeah. which we know will be critical in the rollout of our low carbon technologies. Yeah. We if we do not protect our world leading specialists, we will see communities decimated and ultimately a skills exodus which would put at risk the very transition that we are working so hard to achieve. I thank the right, my right honourable friend for giving way. She's making a very powerful point when it comes to both energy security but also jobs, British jobs, getting those jobs. But does she also agree with me? Recently I visited the Falkland Islands with a cross-party delegation and when we met with the Falkland Island government they are desperate to unlock the, uh, the sea lion field to get British workers to o- o- operate that uh, oil field as well. Obviously Falkland Islands are British overseas territory, yet they are being stymied by the UK Treasury who won't underwrite that. Well, the Honourable Lady say the next point we should do is actually back overseas territories by developing their, their oil fields so we can have good British overseas oil territories, oil and gas, 
in the UK, have British jobs in the overseas territories, and support our one big happy Commonwealth and overseas territories family. Minister. Well, I thank the honourable gentleman. He makes a, an, an interesting point. I'd be very happy to meet with him to discuss that further. But let me turn to investment when it comes to the sector. I think we actually agree across all sides of the House that we want to be a world leader in clean energy technologies. Here in Britain, we have many competitive advantages, and we want to exploit all of them to have a brighter energy and economic future. But right now, the oil and gas sector is investing in hydrogen, in carbon capture and offshore wind. A well-managed transition helps ensure that as we get more investment and we grow these sectors, people people can transition alongside in an orderly and organic way. To shut down the oil and gas sector too, too soon would not only risk that investment, would not only make it harder to do the transition and see those sectors grow more slowly, but it would risk people's livelihoods too. The Offshore Petroleum Licensing Bill will give industry the certainty it needs to invest in this important sector. If we need oil and gas in the decades to come, it should come from Britain where it can. And using the resources on our doorstep to benefit Britain is simple common sense. This new legislation will require the North Sea Transition Authority to run an annual process for new exploration and production licences in the UK continental shelf, subject to key tests being met. First, that the UK is projected to remain a net importer of both oil and gas, and second, that carbon emissions associated with UK gas are lower than imported and liquefied natural gas. These tests are in place to provide assurance that providing, proceeding with annual licensing remains the right thing to do. This bill will provide industry with certainty on the future of licensing rounds, increasing investor and industry confidence. It will increase our energy security. It will protect 200,000 jobs. It will secure tens of billions in tax, in tax revenue and will help us reach net zero. But don't just take my word for it. Voices across industry recognise the need for new licences for net zero and for our energy security. In fact, as Stuart Payne, the CEO of the North Sea Transition Authority, recently wrote, producing as much of the oil and gas we need as possible domestically is the right thing to do for security and the economy. Offshore Energies UK have said the UK needs the churn of new licences to manage production decline. National Gas has said that by backing gas today, we can create jobs, secure energy independence, deliver net zero and keep costs down for households and businesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the General Secretary of the GMB has said that not proceeding with new licensing risks leaving the UK even more dependent on energy imports to heat homes and power industry in future. That is bad for our national security and prosperity. I have no doubt that the opposition will whip its MPs against this bill today. They want to shut down new oil and gas licences. They have been very clear about that. I suspect that there are many in the Labour Party who understand what turning off the taps would mean for British workers, and they will vote against this bill with a heavy heart. They know that the right honourable gentleman has got this wrong. Isn't it just common sense that if we need oil and gas, it should come from UK waters rather than from foreign and often unreliable regimes abroad? Isn't it better to produce our own gas instead of shipping in liquefied natural gas, which has four times the production emissions of our own? Isn't it right that the billions of pounds in tax that we raise from this sector stays here rather than being sent abroad? And isn't it the position of an ideologue to say we will not support 200,000 British workers, but we are happy for those jobs to go to Russia or further abroad? The position of the Labour Party and the SNP is not right for the environment, not right for the economy, and not right for the energy security of this country. As the head of the GMB warned this weekend, it would be exporting jobs for the sake of importing virtue. It would mean thousands of jobs lost, communities decimated, tax revenue forgone, and also the right honourable gentleman can appease his friends in Just Stop Oil. They are putting the interests of extreme climate ideologues over that of ordinary workers. And what of Labour's wider energy policy? The truth is that when it comes to this critical policy area, their policies are as clear as mud. We know that it hinges on borrowing £28 billion. That would mean thousands of pounds in extra taxes for every family. Whilst we are cutting taxes, Mr Deputy Speaker, the opposition would see them soar. That is not what the people of this country need. The right honourable gentleman should level with the British public. What taxes would he raise to pay this extra £28 billion of borrowing? 
The Shadow Business Secretary said that £28 billion is the scale of investment required. The Opposition have said that they need to spend £28 billion in order to meet their 2030 decarbonisation ambition. So why won't the Right Honourable Gentleman opposite set out which taxes he would raise? How is he going to squeeze more money out of hard-working families to achieve his 2030 pipe dream? If he really thinks the £28 billion in extra spending is essential, he should have the courage to explain how much worse off taxpayers will be. And meanwhile, while the Labour Party struggle to back their own plans, over the past few months we have secured £30 billion of private investment in clean energy. And that is the difference between them and us. We know that private investment is key to the transition. They would rather taxpayers shoulder the costs alone through more borrowing and higher taxes. And that is the choice the House must make today. Do we support the oil and gas sector and the private investment that comes with it, or do we leave taxpayers to foot the bill? We cannot afford to lose the skills, the revenue or the investment the sector provides. To do so would put net zero in jeopardy. And we must deliver this transition in a proportionate, pragmatic and realistic way, ensuring that we make the most of the energy we produce right here in the UK. That is common sense. And that is what this legislation represents. With this bill, we will protect 200,000 jobs, strengthen our energy security, secure tens of billions of pounds in tax revenue, ease the transition to renewable energy, and supply us with a gas which owns only a quarter of the production emissions of liquid natural gas imports. Or we could follow the approach of the opposition and decimate communities who rely on the oil and gas sector, rack up borrowing by £28 billion a year, send taxes soaring to pay for it, and send British jobs and tax revenue abroad, all to import fuel with higher emissions. I think the choice is very clear. We are on the side of common sense, not ideology, and I commend this bill to the House. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Ed Miliband. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I move the amendment standing in the name of my honourable, right honourable friend, the Leader of the Opposition, my name and other honourable friends. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, before I address the legislation today, I want to express my deep condolences for the families of the two people killed by Storm Isha and sympathy for all of those facing power cuts and disruption from the storm. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the legislation we are considering today won't cut bills, it won't give us energy security, it drives a coach and horses through our climate commitments and it learns nothing from the worst cost of living crisis in memory that the British people are still going through, a cost of living crisis caused by our dependence on fossil fuels. And since its launch two months ago, Mr Deputy Speaker, the case for this bill has disintegrated upon contact with reality. Let me remind the House of the series of unfortunate events that have befallen the bill since its publication. On day one, launch day, the Energy Secretary went on TV with the big reveal, telling the public that the bill wouldn't cut bills. Next, we discovered from the confidential minutes of the North Sea Transition Authority that they thought the bill was unnecessary and compromised their independence. Then Lord Bra- Oh, oh, the, the, uh, the, um, the Honourable uh, Gentleman says from a, a sedentary position that uh, it's not the case. Uh, that's not the case. He, he's wrong. Let me just read him the minutes. The board expressed a unanimous view that such a proposal was not necessary for the NSTA. The board noted the proposal would significantly challenge one of the tenants of the independence for the NSTA. Of course I give way to As the right hand gentleman is enjoyably quoting the minutes, not on the record of the NSTA, would he he also support their position that we should maximise all of the oil and gas production in the North Sea? That's not, that's not the NSTA's uh, position, as I've uh, d- discussed uh, with them, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So then, Lord Brown, then Lord Brown, the former CEA, CEO of BP, attacked the bill and said it was go- going to, and I quote, "not make any difference to energy security." Then Britain's most respected climate export, expert, Lord Stern, pilloried it as, and I quote, "a deeply damaging mistake." Then on the eve of COP. Then on the eve of COP, the former Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, who signed Net Zero into law, said she disagreed with the bill. I don't think she supports Just Stop Oil, to my knowledge. She disagrees with the bill. Then, the, Of course I don't. Then the former, then the former, then the former COP president, then the former COP, let's be serious, then the former COP president, a man respected 
around the world yeah. who, who we, we are lucky to have uh, playing that role at COP26 said this, that the bill was smoke and mirrors, not being serious, the opposite of what we agreed to do internationally. And finally, their own net zeros are the man they entrusted to guide them on questions of climate energy and energy. He's so disgusted by the bill that he's not in the chamber today. In fact, he's so ashamed. He's so ashamed, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that he has fled to the Chiltern Hundreds. I mean, that's certainly getting a long way away from her, the Honourable Lady and her policies. I mean, it does show how far people will go. Not so much the oil and gas extraction bill, but the Conservative MP extraction bill that she is putting forward in the House today. And in his words, and in his words, and in his words, I can no longer condone nor continue to support a government that is committed to a course of action that I know is wrong and will cause future harm. Now, I think we should take all of these voices, Lord Brown, the former Prime Minister, the former Net Zero Czar, the former COP President. I think, I think we should... I'll, co I'll come to all of the arguments she made, if she'll give me a... If she'll begin as, I, as, I develop, as I develop my argument. Because the bigger point is this, Mr Deputy Speaker. We face massive challenges as a country. But it's not the scale of our problems that is so apparent today. It's the smallness of their response. A two-clause, risible bill that she knows is not going to make any difference to our energy security because everyone who knows anything about this subject says it. Now, as this bill has fallen apart, Mr Deputy Speaker, they've thrashed around to try and find a rational justification, and they've made one futile argument after another, and let's take each in turn. Right, first of all, uh, the first argument was this bill will cut prices. And in case you're thinking, well, did they really make that claim? They did, because the claim was made by the Prime Minister in a tweet at 9.57am on launch day when he said the bill will, and I quote, help reduce energy bills as we're less exposed. Oh, she, she, she nods, but... But I want to put on record my thanks to the Energy Secretary because she's been an internal one-woman rebuttal unit against the Prime Minister because she went on breakfast TV. I mean, actually, she went on breakfast TV before the tweet, so it's sort of pre-buttle, you might call it. Uh, and she said this, the bill, and I quote, wouldn't necessarily bring down energy bills. That's not what, that's not what we are saying. That, and, of course, she's right because oil and gas is traded on international... Well, I will give way to her, definitely. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. And if he had read the full quote, it said that indirectly through the fact that you will support the renewable sector, it brings down bills. Uh, and, and through the fact that you can raise tax to help people with the cost of living, it brings down bills. So if you would like to bring down bills for people in this country, you should Tens back this bill. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker, that's great, because she anticipated my rebuttal of the second bad argument for this bill, which was the argument she went on to make, because she said that the tax revenues we get from fossil fuels justify this policy, and we've heard it again today. I actually think, Mr Deputy Speaker, that if anything, this is an even more complete load of nonsense than the Prime Minister's argument, because these are the facts. It's our reliance on fossil fuels that has caused rocketing energy bills. This meant the government was forced to step in to provide support for households. They should just listen for support for households and businesses. And the cost and the cost to government of the support with bills has far outweighed any tax revenues. According to the OBR, the windfall tax receipts that come from oil and gas companies raise £25 billion, and the cost of government support is over £70 billion, or they say £104 billion. So the idea that our dependence on fossil fuels can be justified by the tax revenues you get when they've had to spend £100 billion trying to help people is obviously nonsense. There's a third bad argument, and again we, and again we heard it today, which is, that, which is that somehow this bill strengthens our energy security. And again, I think it's just important to have a few facts in this, in this debate, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, because... Here are the facts. The UK's North Sea gas production, with new licences, is set to fall by 95% by 2050. 
And without new licenses, by 97%. Right. So that is the equivalent of four days of our current gas demand. Yeah. So all of this absolute codswallop about the idea that this is guaranteeing our energy security, that, that, the, that this is somehow going to guarantee these 200,000 jobs, it's just risible nonsense, Mr Deputy Speaker. And here's the thing, because I think we've actually had a real revelation in this debate, because they've admitted the truth, which is that the vast majority of oil is not used in this country. It, and it is exported elsewhere. And, and, and 70 per cent... And here's, here's the thing. 70, 70 per cent... 70% of our remaining reserves are oil, not gas. So the truth is that the idea this makes any difference to our energy security is nonsense. These are private companies selling on the private market, and they have, no, and they have absolutely no response. Now, the fourth, the, the fourth bad argument, the fourth bad, bad, bad argument is that this bill will somehow protect jobs. And it's wrong again. And look, we, we owe it to oil and gas communities to protect them in the transition. But given their record, given their record in constituencies like mine, we won't take lectures from the Conservative Party on just transitions. And the truth is, and this is the, this is the truth that we should, admit, we should admit in this House, the fossil fuel market is not just deeply unstable for consumers, because that is what's happened over the last two years, it's deeply unstable for workers. And pretending that new licences will some, and, and, pretending, and pretending that new licences will somehow guarantee the jobs for North Sea workers is a total illusion. Just in the last 10 years, the number of people working in oil and gas has more than halved. The International Energy Agency predicts a peak in fossil fuel demand by 2030. That's why the head of the IEA that's why the head of the IEA says this new large scale fossil fuel projects not only carry major climate risks but also business and financial risks for the companies and their investors and that applies to workers too now the right way to have a managed transition in the North Sea is to carry on using existing fields which a labor government will do and to have a plan for North Sea workers by driving forward with jobs in the industries of the future, offshore wind, carbon capture, and hydrogen. But that's not what they've done. We had a graphic example of this last week. We had a graphic example of this last week. The world's largest floating wind prototype sits off Peterhead. That's a good thing. But it needed maintenance. Where did the maintenance happen? Not in Scotland, not anywhere in the UK. It's being towed back to Norway. That is the scale of their industrial policy failure, which we know very, very well. They haven't generated the jobs here that Brit the British workers deserve. And of course, and of course, and of course, their fossil fuel policy and net zero rollback has sent a terrible message to investors around the world. This is Amanda Blank, the CEO of Aviva and the head of their own UK transition plan task force. This is what she says about oil and gas and their position. This puts at clear risk the jobs, growth, and the additional investment the UK requires to become more climate ready. It is Britain, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is Britain losing the global race for clean energy jobs that will destroy the future of oil and gas communities. They have no proper plan for those workers. We do have a proper plan. And the fifth... And the fifth... And the, I will. I'm really grateful to him for giving way. Can I just say, does he agree with me that this bill is an absolute disaster for climate diplomacy? Yep turning diligent negotiators into hypocrites and trashing our international negotiations and international reputation. Isn't it clear without proper diplomacy, this gener future generations are going to be left with a much more dangerous and less stable world? I think my honourable friend is absolutely right. And she, take, and she takes me on to the fifth and final bad argument uh, that they are making, which is that somehow, which is that somehow that I will in a moment, which is that somehow this bill can be justified on climate grounds. Now, making this argument 
demands a level of absurdity that should make even this government deeply embarrassed. Let, let's just get this straight. We have signed a global agreement at COP28 for a transition away from fossil fuels in line with the science. That science is unequivocal. We must leave the majority of fossil fuels in the ground. But at home, at home their domestic policy is what they call maxing out the North Sea. So, so let's, let's get this clear, Mr Deputy Speaker. In the coming crucial two years, government ministers will be travelling around the world to try and turn that agreement to COP28 into reality. But how will the conversation go? The UK minister will say to other countries, we want you to leave your fossil fuels in the ground, because that's the agreement at COP28. And then the country exactly. we're trying to persuade will say to us, but hang on a minute, you're saying we should leave our fossil fuels in the ground, but you're planning to extract all of, your, all, all of yours. Literally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I mean, what will we say? Other than, well, yes, the government is practising total hypocrisy, but please do as we say, not as we do. I mean, that is the truth. The science is unequivocal. I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. To the right honourable gentleman for giving way, I was hoping to get in when he was speaking about jobs and investment because he quoted uh, an awful lot of people. And I wonder why did he not quote Sir Ian Wood, who said of Labour's plans for the North Sea oil and gas industry, they would, and I quote, place in jeopardy tens of thousands of jobs. And David Whitehouse of Offshore Energy at UK, their chief executive, said Labour's plans would create a cliff edge, deterring investment and heightening our risk of energy shortages. Why did he not mention these people? Well, look, I'm very happy to talk about Ian Wood. We, we had a very good round table with Ian Wood in, in Aberdeen, in, 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 Aber, in, Aberdeen in, in November. And look, you know, I totally accept that it's, for, that it's for government of either party to show there is a proper transition plan. I believe that we firmly believe that we can do it. But I honestly say to the Honourable, I honestly say to the Honourable Gentleman, the idea that new licences is somehow going to guarantee a future for those North Sea workers, he knows that's not the case. How can you possibly say, how can you possibly say that four days worth of oil and uh, worth of gas demand in 2050 is somehow going to guarantee a future for those workers? I was talking, uh, I, I will. Reference the right, and gentlemen. Uh, he will know that 10% of our current oil consumption uh, is used in manufacturing industry, not to be burnt. Uh, but for things like lubricants, solvents, uh, and actually for electronic components. Um, so it doesn't contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. Is it acceptable to extract them from UK waters? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'd, I'd say to the Honourable Gentleman, 80% of what we get from UK waters, waters is exported, not produced here. And we said very clearly, we will continue with existing oil and gas fields. We're continuing with those things. Of course there has to be a transition. But, but the idea that we can just carry on regardless and max out the North Sea, and I know he cares about climate. I know he cares about this. And I do think it's very important in this to listen to the voices. I mean, th there must be a reason why the International Energy Agency, the Energy Transitions Commission, the Climate Change Committee, the former president of COP26, what, what, Nick Stern, Lord Stern, I mean, you know, these are the people who are the respected authorities on climate, and they all say, look, the world has got, is, is genuinely on a burning platform. And unless we address the issue of fossil fuels, uh, we're going to head not to one and a half degrees, but to three degrees of warming. And that is the truth. That is the truth. And it is incredibly hard to do this. So the idea that we're going to say, well, look, yes, there's a climate crisis. Uh, yes, this won't make any difference for energy security. Yes, as the Energy Secretary says, it won't cut bills. Yes, it's not the answer for jobs of the future. But we're going to carry on doing it anyway. I mean, that is climate vandalism. I genuinely say that to the right honourable gentleman who cares about these issues. He and I have sort of, he shadowed me 15 years ago, a long time ago. You know, I know he cares about these issues. You know, along with the um, honourable member for we Reading West, you know... <sighs> People who really care about these issues have wrestled with this question. We've listened to the experts and we've thought to ourselves, look, what does the science tell us on the one hand and what difference will this make on the other? And I think fair-minded people have reached the conclusion that I've reached, that Lord Stern has reached and all the other authorities uh, that, that we... Of course I will. I, I thank my honourable friend for giving way. I previously raised in this chamber the progress report from the Climate Change Committee, which said the government was off track. 
The Secretary of State then assured the House that the government remains extremely ambitious about climate change. So does my honourable friend agree that the Secretary of State must have meant she is supportive of causing climate change, given that she is pressing ahead with the new oil and gas licences? Look, look I, I, I don't believe that this sort of fulfils the kind of uh, climate leadership that we pride ourselves on in this country. And I know when I went to COP28, you know, we're, we're saying... I mean, here's another interesting fact for the House. UKEF, UK Export Finance, I think with the guidance of the right member for Reading West, decided at COP26 we won't finance oil and gas projects abroad. Now, there must be a reason why UKEF decided that. And presumably the reason is because we want to make the transition away from fossil fuels. So at the same time as deciding, UKEF deciding that we're not going to do that, again, we look like hypocrites if we do this by saying, well, we're just going to carry on maxing out at home. So I know there are other people who want to speak, Mr Deputy Speaker. So, so, we, so we have a bill... Oh, go on. You're, it's very tempting. So uh, I'll give way to the... The right hon. Gentleman, I'm grateful for him to give way. The right hon. Gentleman spoke for an awful long time, and I suspect he's coming to the end of his speech, so that backbenchers can participate. Not one, not one idea has he put into the floor of this house what Labour would do were they to take over from us. I'll tell him, I'll tell him exactly what we do. I'm really grateful to him for intervening. Sorry, he's lengthened my speech. Uh, we'd establish a national wealth fund to invest in British jobs, to give a future in steel and automotive and investing in our ports. We'd set up GB Energy to generate wealth for our citizens. If it's good enough for countries abroad, why isn't it good enough for us? We insulate homes across this country. We'd finally lift the onshore wind ban, yes. the disgraceful onshore wind ban that's adding £180 to every family in this country's bills. That's just a start. I don't want to detain the House for too long but there's plenty more where that came from. Mr Deputy Speaker, the truth is, I won't give way, the truth is that there are, that there are two roads for Britain's future, driving to clean energy by 2030 to cut bills and make us energy independent, GB Energy to bring jobs in clean energy here at home and be a climate leader, or a government that takes, I won't give way, or a government that takes the wrong path, clings to expensive, insecure fossil fuels and makes the British people pay the price as they have for the past 14 years. The truth is, Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill speaks volumes about a government out of ideas and embarked on that second path. This bill is one of the last desperate acts of a dying government. I urge the House to support our reasoned amendment and vote against their bill tonight. The original question was that the bill be now read a second time. Since when? An amendment has been proposed as on the older paper. The question is that the amendment be made. Alok Sharma. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I refer the House to my register of members' interests. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I agree with the Secretary of State, who I hold in high regard. The United Kingdom has been a leader in climate action internationally. We have cut our emissions in half over the past 30 years faster than any other major economy in recent years, and we've set ambitious domestic emission reduction targets, particularly ahead of COP26. And through our COP26 presidency, we managed to get over 90% of the global economy signed up to net zero. Just about every G20 nation signed up to a net zero commitment. We led on climate action domestically, and we translate that into leading the world on climate action. And Mr Deputy Speaker, just a few weeks ago at COP28, the UK, alongside other nations, signed up to transition away from fossil fuels. And on his return from COP28, my right honourable friend, the member for Beverly and Holderness, welcomed this global agreement from the dispatch box. He spoke about the importance of listening to the voices of the most climate vulnerable island nations, who, as we know, wanted the world to agree to stronger language, to phase out fossil fuels. Indeed, my right honourable friend himself tweeted at COP28, there must be a phase-out of unabated fossil fuels to meet our climate goals. And I commend the work that he, indeed, the whole of the UK team did in Dubai. But today, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have a bill before this House, the sole purpose of which is to double down on granting more oil and gas production licences. I do not believe, and it pains me to say this, that this bill will 
advance that commitment to transition away from fossil fuels. I also do not believe that those climate vulnerable nations that my Rodham friend referred to will think this bill is consistent with the pledge that we, we along with every other nation, made in Dubai. Now, in terms of substance of the bill, as it's currently drafted, and I'm really sorry to say this, it really does pain me to say this, that I think it is somewhat of a distraction, because I don't think it's necessary. The North Sea Transition Authority can already grant licenses annually, or indeed when they think it necessary, and they've been doing that regularly over the past few years. The Department's own explanatory notes accompanying this bill make clear, and I quote, the NSTA will remain free to grant licenses outside this new annual duty in the usual way, whether or not the new statutory tests are met. And as for the two statutory tests, they seem to override the already non-binding climate compatibility checkpoint. And, and I have to say this, that I think they have been designed in a way for the computer to always say yes to new oil and gas licenses. Overall, the ability of the NSTA to grant new licenses does not change materially with this bill. But sadly, what this bill does do, and this is my opinion, and others will have theirs, it does do is to reinforce the unfortunate perception about the UK rowing back from climate action, uh, as indeed we saw last autumn with the chopping and changing of some policies. And it does make our international partners question the seriousness with which we take our international commitments. And, and I say that it pains me to say this, Mr. Speaker, because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because I know the government has been coming forward under this Secretary of State with commitments uh, to try and tackle uh, climate change, to try and deliver on a clean energy transition. Now, we've also heard that this bill is about improving domestic energy security. But I think we all understand that the oil and gas extracted from the North Sea it is owned by private enterprises, uh, and the government doesn't get to control uh, who uh, this is sold to. Um, and in addition, I think it's, it's, it's acknowledged that this bill would not necessarily lower domestic energy bills in the UK. That price for oil and gas as a commodity is set internationally. I think the best way to enhance our energy security and ultimately bring down bills is for the government to continue to deliver on its ambitious plans for expanding homegrown clean energy, which I know the Secretary of State and her ministers are absolutely committed to. More wind power, more solar, more nuclear as part of a diversified clean energy mix. And I, and I back the Secretary of State uh, in the work that she and her team are doing in delivering that clean energy mix. Now, in terms of jobs, um, you know, we've heard about uh, the bill securing 200,000 jobs. Uh, of course, Mr. Speaker, people's jobs and livelihoods absolutely matter. And we have to ensure that we secure jobs. But we also have to recognize that we're in an energy transition. I support an orderly transition. Uh, for me, this isn't about turning off the taps overnight on oil and gas. Uh, and we do have to acknowledge that over 200,000 jobs supported by the oil and gas industry have been lost over the past decade. And that is despite hundreds of new drilling licenses being issued. Now, we also know that many of the skills used in the oil and gas sector are transferable to clean energy, to offshore wind, to geothermal. And if we want to truly turbocharge a clean energy transition, we need to help support and retrain those workers transitioning over time out of the fossil fuel sector into the many tens of thousands of jobs that are being created in clean energy as a result of the work the Secretary of State and her team are doing. Yes, of course. I, I thank him for giving way, and he's making some very powerful points. And I have huge respect for him on this topic. Does he agree with me uh, that we are in real danger of turning off the interest and investment appetite from many other nations, Korea, Japan, and others, who see the UK as having vast expertise in offshore uh, wind development sites? and that this kind of announcement, this legislation, will under, undermine that market? Well, Mr Speaker, um, th there was some commentary uh, uh, in terms of 
uh, you know, concerns about investment appetite uh, following some of the, the, comment, the statements that were made in the autumn. But uh, I think we also have to acknowledge that the government has, over the last few months, managed to get uh, billions of dollars, uh, billions of pounds, rather, of uh, extra investment committed uh, within clean energy to the UK. Um, but I, I want to turn to the carbon intensity test for granting new licences. Um, I, and I, I have to say again that I'm not sure they recognise the whole picture of where we get uh, our imports from. The majority of gas the UK imports comes by pipeline from Norway. It, it isn't imported LNG. And the carbon intensity of Norwegian gas production is around half that of UK domestic gas. So, so if that is the test that the government wants to apply in deciding whether to issue new licences, I think it should take into account the average carbon intensity of all imported gas, not just LNG. And given that uh, around 70% of remaining North Sea reserves are oil, perhaps the test should also include the carbon intensity of UK produced oil, which is higher than the global average. Yes, of course. I put that very point that he has raised there to the Secretary of State in our select committee and her response was that because almost all of our oil is exported out of the UK for processing, we don't know what the full carbon intensity is. Is this not a great example of why uh, our oil is not actually used in Britain and it will not help British people? Well, Mr Speaker, um, the Secretary of State has uh, set out uh, her position uh, very clearly and eloquently. Uh, what I'm trying to do is set out my position, I see it, on this, this bill. Um, but just to, just to move to this point about the Climate Change Committee, um, and I think the government said that the Independent Climate Change Committee's own data shows that we're going to need new oil and gas in the decades ahead. But I just respectfully say that this isn't the same as saying that new licences should be granted. And the weekend before this bill was originally due to have its second reading, the interim chair of the Climate Change Committee uh, put out a tweet to reconfirm the, the Climate Change Committee's position, and he wrote, the CCC UK evidence is that continued expansion of new oil and gas reserves is inconsistent with our climate commitments, especially more so in light of the recent global stock tape COP agreement we have just signed. Uh, Mr Speaker, for the reasons that I've outlined, I will not vote for this bill today. But assuming that this bill does proceed beyond second reading, I hope it will be possible working with like-minded colleagues and indeed uh, the, the government and the Secretary of State and her ministers to amend and improve the tests that are required to be met before any new oil and gas production licence are granted in the future. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, delivering on the UK's clean energy transition matters on many levels for jobs, for inward investment, for lower bills, for real energy security, and of course, for the environment. We've seen the impacts of the changing climate around us daily. 2023 was the hottest year on record globally. In recent weeks, many people have faced flooding again in our country, including in my own constituency. We really shouldn't need any more wake-up calls to put aside the distractions and act with the urgency the situation demands. Yeah. Yeah. Dave Dugan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The SNP, um, the SNP declines to give this bill uh, a, second, a second reading. It's, if the, would, they, would they like to intervene already, Mr Deputy Speaker? I'm happy to take it. Um, so uh, this bill is unnecessary, much like the chuntering from a sedentary position, as it is unwelcome, uh, Mr. Speaker. The government, uh, the government have claimed that, that this, uh, the Prime Minister rather, no less, uh, claimed that this would reduce energy bills. But of course, this is untrue, and the Secretary of State was well advised to distance herself from this fantasy. It's claimed that this bill will assist with the UK's energy security, when of course it will do no such thing given the combined effects of an international energy market and the vagaries of the UK's refining capacity, which is increasingly and substantially incompatible with oil extracted from the North Sea Basin. The government seeks to gaslight us with claims that there are strict tests to be met in order to issue any new licences, when in fact these Potemkin tests will inevitably be met for each and every licence application in the future should this bill pass. This bill will not provide an evidence-based assessment of all licences on a case-by-case -case basis. And as a matter of actual fact, 
Mr Deputy Speaker. 27 new licences were granted in 2023 alone, in the absence of any such legislation of this nature. And a licensing round has been held by the North Sea Transition Authority every year and a half since 2016. This proposed legislation will, in effect, undermine the NSTA by placing a statutory obligation on them to hold new licensing rounds every year, rather than currently, as and when the NSTA deem necessary in their professional capacity. Moreover, the NSTA board unanimously agreed that the legislation requiring annual licensing rounds was unnecessary. But the government are advancing this as a means to guarantee unfettered access to continued hydrocarbon extraction. This is not what we need, Mr Deputy Speaker. The proponents of this bill would have us believe that more licences will deliver lower energy bills. It will achieve no such thing. We all recognise that oil and gas will continue to be an essential part of our energy mix. And as the previous speaker said, we use oil and gas, uh, certainly oil, for more than combustible uh, uh, uses. And so we will need a measured and qualified licensing regime to accommodate this ongoing reliance on oil and gas as a source of energy and much else. But that is not what this bill proposes. And a lack of licensing is not what is pushing up the price of household and commercial energy. It is the price of gas on the international market, which consumers are forced to pay, not just for heating, but also for the electricity, given the bizarre pricing structure in the, and the way that the UK is set up to favour gas. An energy pricing disaster, which is compounded by this government's failure to properly invest in alternatives such as large-scale, long-duration storage solutions, which would dial a considerable amount of gas out of the system. That, Mr Deputy Speaker, would dial down prices as well. It is 14 years of Tory mismanagement of energy security, which has seen barely sufficient investment going into uh, renewable generation to meet, to meet the demands of the climate emergency, and practically none into the network to transmit this new energy, meaning consumers are denied access to large swathes of cheap green renewable energy because of grid capacity, a renewable energy uh, once switched off to compensate for a 1960 network gets substituted by gas. That is the thing, an improvement, an investment in capital infrastructure, and I appreciate that the government are doing it, but it is 14 years too late. This bill will not deliver energy security, Mr Deputy Speaker. Indeed, the former uh, Chief Executive, uh, Executive of BP, Lord Brown, said that, this is the, this, that the, the government's decision to expand North Sea drilling is not going to make any difference to Britain's energy security. And the former head of the NSTA, Andy Samuel, stated in 2022 that the introduction of new licences would only make a difference around the edges. What we need from the government is a bold plan to further accelerate the electrification from renewables of our domestic energy market. What we are presented with is a backward-looking cash grab for Scotland's hydrocarbons, which comes at the cost of the just transition. Scotland will lose out by having our energy policy dictated by a Luddite and remote Westminster government focused relentlessly on the rearview mirror rather than on the future. And on job security, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will give way. He's talking about energy policy being directed um, by uh, other people. Um, does he share my concern about our continued membership of the Energy Charter Treaty, which means any deals that are signed now would have to be fully remunerated on their potential hope value and not on their actual value if they were decided to no longer a sovereign Britain or a sovereign Scotland. I'm you know, neutral on this issue, but uh, whether they were to then be phased out or cancelled? And does he not think, like our European partners, we should be withdrawing from the Energy Charter Treaty to allow ourselves true energy independence? I, I, I thank the Honourable Gentleman, Mr Deputy Speaker, for his intervention. I, I agree entirely with his ambitions as regards the Energy Charter Treaty, and it is about time the Government got off the fence on this issue and actually made a decision on it. On job security, Mr Deputy Speaker, let us be really clear. This Government cares for oil and gas workers in Scotland every bit as much as they cared for the miners in Scotland, every bit as much as they cared for the manufacturing jobs that were put to the sword in the 80s, every much as they cared for their service personnel living in squalor, every bit as much as they care about the post office staff thrown into the privatisation mincer, and every bit as much as they care for uh, junior doctors in England. I will, of course, give away. 
I thank the Honourable Gentleman for, for giving way. And just before I get to the point, I spoke about miners, I just want to make it clear my previous uh, intervention, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, to, re to refer people to my register of uh, declaration of interest about my Falkland Islands trip, which was paid for by the Falkland Islands Government. But on the Honourable Gentleman's point, he talks about the miners, and exactly right in South Yorkshire, uh, in Rother Valley, we were hit hard by the closure of mines, and that's why we need that transition. And by keeping these new licences going, that makes the transition will be slightly uh, longer and keep more people in jobs. Surely that is a good thing to diminish the impact, the negative impact, that net zero will sometimes bring to certain people. Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, the premise of the Honourable Gentleman's intervention is that by delaying and maximising oil and gas production, you somehow make, maintain the link. You could just as easily deliver the same thing by accelerating the uh, delivery of renewable energy and the infrastructure to transmit it to where it's needed. But it's, that is not what the, and that would have the added benefit of introducing lower bills for consumers and industry and making sure that we weren't reliant on hydro on petro states from far away with a questionable regime. So, no, I'm looking, at the teles I'm looking through the right end of the telescope. The Honourable Gentleman and his government are looking through the wrong end. In short, in short Mr Speaker, uh, these Tories couldn't give a flying fig for any worker on these islands, and as long as, only as long as their share price remains healthy to hang with the rest of us. And if the question is, how do we protect uh, 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 and transition oil and gas jobs into renewable energy production, the answer is definitely not to overstimulate unlimited offshore petroleum licensing. Because according to industry data, 441,000 jobs were supported by the oil and gas sector in 2013. But this has already fallen to 213,000. 200,000 fewer jobs, 200,000 fewer jobs in 2022. This, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Government has issued uh, approximately 400 new drilling licences and five separate licensing rounds during this period. The claim that there is a direct and proportionate relationship between the amount of licences issued and the amount of jobs sustained is entirely spurious. And uh, yes, of course. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. Can he explain to the House and, importantly, his constituents in Angus, I know many of whom are employed in this industry, what the SNP's current position is on the issuing of new oil and gas licences? At the moment, just now, do they support them or is there a presumption against them? So what's important, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the understanding that we will be reliant on oil and gas. And what this government is, what this government is enduring is making a false dichotomy between having unlimited new licences and having an oil and gas sector in Scottish waters and, and within the UK. The two, things are not, uh, the two things are not related in the fashion that the government is setting out. Now, what, the, what he should be asking is why will the UK, and I'll get on to this in a minute, why will the UK not match the Scottish government's ambition for the just transition and a half a billion pounds investment. But I'll get on to that in a second. So, I'm not, are you asking me if I'm giving way? No. On, uh, so, uh, and, where the, uh, and where is the guaranteed ring fencing of revenues, Mr Deputy Speaker, from North Sea oil and gas production for use to develop more renewable energy and accelerate the just transition? Because it's accelerating the just transition, not unduly sustaining legacy energy uh, production uh, that, will make, that will make the difference and deliver real jobs with sustainable, sustainability, both in terms of the carbon outputs and in terms of how those jobs will last into the future. Where is that support, Mr Deputy Speaker? The Government have claimed that circa £50 billion in tax revenue over the next five years, they, they advise, could be used, could be used to support a, cleaner, a shift to cleaner forms of energy. Well, we are used to jam tomorrow from this Government, Mr Speaker, and so too can any form of fiscal revenue be used to support um, future development of renewable. And so, too, Mr. S uh, so the vacuous observation that the government has made is, to be, is, is so unconnected to reality, so unconditioned and unqualified to be utterly uh, meaningless. Uh, it would have been uncharacteristically elegant in a solution for this government to have ring-fenced future oil and gas revenue for the green tra transition, to marry the endowment of the legacy hydrocarbon industry to prime the pump of opportunities for the next renewable uh, industry. But this... A government is at least consistent in their ability to disappoint. So, uh, to the casualty of the climate from this bill, uh, which is uh, an, an inevitable consequence of this uh, course of action, we can add uh, the pace of delivery from uh, new net zero opportunities in Scotland. And when oil and gas opportunities do go to a plateau of exhaustion in Scotland, and when uh, 
as everybody knows that they will, when will the cupboard, what will be left in the cupboard to support communities like in uh, Banff and Buchan, like in Angus, in West Aberdeenshire, in Kincardine, and, uh, and elsewhere in the northeast of Scotland. Why is, that, why is the revenues from historic exploitation of oil and gas not gone into accelerating renewable opportunities and making sure that we deliver uh, jobs uh, for uh, the future? The Scottish Government, to my earlier point to the Honourable Gentleman's uh, intervention, has invested £500 million into the green transition for Scotland. <laughs> it's allocated. <laughs> well, it, thank, it, so, so it's, ring, it's, it's uh, unlike anything to do with this bill. That is funding that is allocated and is there to be invested. Now, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, Mr. Speaker. This government are nervous of that figure, and that's because um, if, West, if the UK was to match Scotland's ambition in the just transition, uh, it would be five billion across the UK. But we see no such commitment. We see no such vision and no such climate ambition. What we see is a Tory Prime Minister who can't effectively lead his party, let alone the UK state, or an energy transition, seeking to divide people on the climate, rolling back on climate action commitments and signals given to industry on EVs and boiler replacements, while over-exploiting Scotland's legacy hydrocarbon and dragging its feet on CCUS, especially at ACORN. Mr Deputy Speaker, the picture is relieved for even those with the largest blinkers. The hallmark of failure is stamped on this Tory government, who will politicise anything, even the climate consensus, in a vain attempt to stem their electoral destruction. This bill, bill fails to outline a transition away from fossil fuels, as per the agreement at COP28. Mr Deputy Speaker, the ink is barely dry on that agreement at COP28, an agreement which the UK delegation signed up to in the full knowledge of this bill's impending passage. We all know the UK has a questionable approach to its international obligations, but this is plain bad faith. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill does not acknowledge the climate emergency. In fact, this bill, in this bill, the Tory government are thumbing their noses at the climate challenge we all face together and should address together. And in this bill, the government seeks to overcapitalise on legacy energy production rather than invest in the renewable energy jobs of the future. Much of that employment and enterprise will be in demand mitigation with thermal insulation, equipment upgrades and new technologies. As a result of the ambition that drives this bill, the warped thinking behind it, jobs will suffer, the economy will suffer, bill payers will suffer and the climate will suffer. So I urge members to decline a second reading. Thank you. Peter Aldous. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Energy production, either offshore in the form of oil and gas production and offshore wind, or on the coast in the form of nuclear, is of specific interest to the Waveney constituency that I represent. The oil and gas industry has been a significant employer locally for nearly 60 years. One of the largest clusters of offshore wind farms in the world is located off the East Anglian coast, and Sizeable Sea will bring significant job-creating opportunities to the area. To realise the full potential of these opportunities, both nationally and locally, we need the right policy, fiscal and regulatory frameworks which satisfy the three criteria of energy security, affordability and decarbonisation. It is also necessary to provide investors with the confidence and certainty to invest in the UK. It should be borne in mind that the market for energy capital is global, footloose and highly competitive. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is against this backdrop that we should judge this bill. There are reasons for supporting it, but we must not lose sight of the need for long-term stability and consistency in energy policy that is required to attract the enormous amount of private investment that we require to modernise and decarbonise our energy system and to make it more secure and resilient. Mr Deputy Speaker, I chair the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Offshore Oil and Gas, and I highlight three factors that I believe should be borne in mind in setting energy policy. Firstly, we are moving away from businesses, wherever they are in the supply chain, which specialise in a particular sector, whether that is oil and gas, offshore wind, carbon capture or hydrogen. 
these businesses are increasingly becoming all energy companies mm -hmm. that work in a range of different sectors. Yeah. Secondly, as I've mentioned, many of these businesses are globally footloose and will operate anywhere in the world. If we have policy, regulatory and fiscal regimes which are continuously flip-flopping, they will go elsewhere. Thirdly, it should be emphasised that the vast majority of these companies, and I would highlight those operating in East Anglia, they are committed to net zero. They regard it as both a moral and a legal obliga obligation from which we should not be distracted. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I've mentioned, there are reasons to support this bill, and I shall briefly highlight them. Firstly, our energy policy is determined by the trinity of energy security, affordability and decarbonisation. Recent geopolitical events, in particular the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the conflict in the Middle East, have created major concerns with regard to security of, su of supply and unpredictability of price. We have felt the backlash of the latter very harshly in the past two years, and its impact hits hardest the poorest and most vulnerable. It is against this backdrop that it is sensible for the UK to be more energy independent and to use our own energy supplies, whether that is offshore wind, nuclear or oil and gas. Secondly, we do need to be reducing our reliance on oil and gas, and indeed we have made good progress in doing this, as the UK has decreased oil production by 66% since 2003. At the turn of the century, we were producing 4.5 million barrels of oil equivalent today, per day. Today, it is below 1.5 million and still falling. However, we do still rely on oil and gas for much of our energy needs, and we shall continue to do so, albeit on a significantly declining trajectory in the coming decades. It is in this context that it is logical to use our own oil and gas. It should be pointed out, as others have done, that the carbon footprint of domestic gas production <laughs> is around a quarter of that associated with imported and energy-intensive liquefied natural gas. Thirdly, at a time of global economic <coughs> uncertainty, as well as geopolitical instability, we do need to have in mind the huge benefits that the oil and gas industry brings to our, to our country. Domestic oil and gas production provides many jobs and adds approximately £16 billion to the UK economy each year. Whilst tax receipts are significant, £33.7 billion since 2010 and an estimated £50 billion over the next five years. Fourthly, as I've mentioned, Today's energy companies operate across a variety of sectors, and there is a risk that if we close down the North Sea too quickly, we will imperil investment in new low-carbon sectors. Many companies investing in nascent opportunities require a cash flow from a stable and predictable oil and gas business. Moreover, freedom to explore can be a major driver for investment in the, on the UK continental shelf, not only in oil and gas fields, but also in carbon capture and hydrogen production. Closing the door on exploration reduces the option value of the UK as a destination for overall investment. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, it should be pointed out that most of the new licences that would be granted would be, would be near fields adjoining existing ones. This means that they will be there will be a lower incremental emission intensity as production will take place using existing facilities. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's important to emphasise that this bill is not a panacea for the future of the North Sea. There is other work that the government must carry out alongside it. One of the most notable achievements of the Conservative government in recent years was the creation in 2016 of the Oil and Gas Authority, which now operates as the North Sea Transition Authority. It is a regulatory authority which has achieved a great deal and which has recognised the vital importance of net zero. The NSTA's great advantage of its predecessor 
which was embedded in the Department of Energy and Climate Change, is its independence <coughs> of government. There is a worry, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this bill undermines that independence, and I do hope that my right honourable friend, the Minister, in his summing up, can take on board and allay this concern. The Government should also consider providing the NSTA with an enhanced role. As the, as the transition has become centre stage to the authorities' work, they have taken on additional regulatory responsibilities for CCUS and hydrogen. Consideration should be given to adding to this the oversight of the emerging geothermal sector and an increased focus on the offshore energy supply chain and maximising the future use by low carbon technologies of the infrastructure that has been laid down in the North Sea over the past 60 years. Mr Deputy Speaker, we are at times in danger of talking glibly about a just transition and the creation of new jobs. We can help achieve this in a meaningful way by focusing more strategically on skills and infrastructure. I'm also mindful that the regulatory space on the UK continental shelf is a crowded one. As well as the NSTA, there are other organisations such as the Marine Man Man Management Organisation and the Crown Estate carrying out important work. We must make sure that all of this work is properly coordinated, is effective in its precautionary objectives and is not overly bureaucratic so as to deter investment. I've mentioned that the majority of, of businesses working in the North Sea are committed to the transition. Yes, they want the government to be realistic and pragmatic about the future of domestic oil and gas industry, but they are also ambitious. They want to be part of an industry that is in the vanguard of the transition from fossil fuels to renewables, global leaders on the road to net zero. For example, this should mean a more ambitious climate compatibility checkpoint and bringing forward the ban on routine venting and flaring. Mr Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, this bill does have merit, but it does need to be accompanied by other measures, some of which I have outlined, so as to maximise the enormous amount of private investment that is required to decarbonise, and to also we need this to dispel any notion among investors as to the UK's commitment to delivering our net zero targets. As the Government has stated, there is a need for pragmatism, proportionality and realism, but this must be accompanied by ambition, consistency and clarity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sarah Champion. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am very concerned that this bill is going to do much more harm than good. Don't be fooled that it would help with our energy prices or our commitment to net zero. The Energy Secretary has quote, is quoted as saying that new production of oil and gas wouldn't necessarily bring energy bills down, but could do so indirectly if money raised in taxes was then used for renewable energy projects. I, I don't understand the logic of this. Countless people, including many of my constituents, are in desperate need of lower energy bills and are struggling to make ends meet because of endless price hikes that this government has done little to abate. I don't believe this bill is going to have any impact on that. If the Minister knows that renewables are the answer, why isn't she prioritising them rather than pushing forward with this illogical and, I'll argue, damaging bill? Worse than not prioritising, the Minister is making the situation worse. Ernst & Young has found that the UK has become a less attractive place to invest in renewables, partly due to a recent diminishing of green policies. Currently, three quarters of North Sea oil and gas operators invest nothing in UK renewables. And whilst we all end up dealing with the consequences of climate change, it is other nations' homes and likely livelihoods that will be destroyed first. The International Development Committee, which I chair, conducted a report on debt relief, which found that lower-income countries are more vulnerable to loss and damage from climate change than higher-income countries, even though they contribute the tiniest proportion. Our current inquiry into small island developing states, SIDS, heard that they are particularly at risk from climate shock. 
In this century alone, two SIDS could disappear forever due to rising sea levels. Lower income countries are being forced to pay for the damage they did not cause yes, yes. and have the least ability to cope with. Meanwhile, this Conservative government wants to hand out more licences in the North Sea with no regard for how it could impact on other countries, our own climate financing or marine life. There is currently no provision within the bill to exempt marine protected areas, MPAs, from oil and gas exploration. I find this an extraordinary omission. Yeah. It is absolutely crucial that no MPAs are put at risk because of this bill. By ignoring this, the government are jeopardising their own Environment Target Acts and, committing to uh, and commitment to effectively protect 30% of the sea for nature by 2030 under the Global Biodiversity Framework. MPAs are designed to safeguard some of the most vulnerable marine habitats and species from irreversible damage. As it stands, only 8% of English MPAs offer effective protection for nature, and 56% of features within them have been assessed as being in an unfavourable condition already before this bill goes forwards. How is the government going to enhance the existing MPAs when they can't even guarantee that they won't be destroyed by this nonsensical bill. An effective MPA framework would ensure UK seas perform their vital function in the fight against climate change and boost biodiversity that is so essential for a functioning and sustainable fishing industry. It would improve the resilience of marine species to, changing, to, change conditions, to changing conditions and continue to support the economic and recreational activities essential to so many people in the UK. All of these benefits would be jeopardised by allowing oil and gas drilling within MPAs. This bill must be amended to ensure that MPAs are completely off the table when oil and gas search and production blocks are considered. <coughs> Whether it's oil spills, underwater noise pollution or the direct destruction of habitats, there is no doubt that there is severe risk of harm to individual creatures across populations of marine wildlife and ultimately the disruption of entire ecosystems. Yet it appears the government is happy to do this if it means even more profit for private industry. Yeah, yeah. We are supposed to be a leader on the global stage. We signed up to the Paris Agreement and agreed to loss and damage funds, but this government are destroying our international reputation and any ability they may have had to encourage other countries to fulfil their climate obligations. It saddens me it's come to this, and I urge the government to think again, listen to their own MPs, especially the wise words of the Right Honourable Member for Reading West, and stop this bill now. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's uh, an honour to, to speak in this debate uh, about the oil and gas sector, the industry uh, and the jobs that rely on it. And certainly in my uh, Murray constituency, there are many people uh, employed in the sector. They travel through to Aberdeen to go offshore, uh, and it is uh, a regular commute for many people. Uh, and that is the case in uh, towns and villages throughout Murray, uh, such as Bucky. Uh, and since I've been able to get Bucky uh, into uh, the opening of this debate about oil and gas, it hopefully allows me the opportunity, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, to put on record uh, my appreciation to the club for an outstanding match that they played against Glasgow Celtic yesterday uh, at Parkhead uh, in the Scottish Cup. Uh, they sadly lost at uh, 5-0, but it was uh, a, an outstanding uh, uh, game for the Highland League team. Uh, Graham Stewart and his players did not just the club, the Highland League, uh, the community uh, and Bucky itself uh, proud. Um, they have come away uh, with uh, an, an absolute uh, host of new fans uh, because of what they uh, achieved over the uh, weeks uh, since that game first came into the public domain. And I think it's been great to see cup fever uh, in Bucky and stalwarts uh, of the club uh, recognised, such as uh, Annie Jaffe uh, and Sandra Patterson, uh, for everything they've done with the club over many years. And I'm sure the congratulations of everyone in the house goes to Bucky Thistle for their uh, achievements. I will, I, will uh, I will give way. <laughs> I, I, of course, join them in congratulating Bucky Thistle. But can you answer just one question? Which side played in the home strip? <laughs> well, it was, of course, they both play in the uh, green and white hoops, and Celtic played in green and white hoops.
white uh, and Bucky uh, were in yellow. But as I say, this is uh, an important debate for many uh, towns uh, and villages and communities in Murray who have a large number of people living in that area uh, employed in the oil uh, and gas sector. And while it's important for my constituents uh, in Murray, and I've been very clear that I think it's right that we continue to grant new oil and gas licences to continue the exploration uh, in the North Sea, while there is still uh, a demand that needs to be supplied, uh, I think people will be left wondering what is the current position uh, of the SNP. It's why I put a, a very direct question to the honourable gentleman for Angus. And normally at this point, I would say to any SNP member is willing to uh, intervene on me, I, I will give way if they're able to answer. Now, there's only one, so uh, it's a very direct ask to the honourable gentleman for Angus. Would he like to intervene to just say very simply what his party position is and what his personal position is to the people of Angus and the people of Scotland? Do the SNP support uh, the granting of new oil and gas licences? Yes or no? I'll give way. I thank the honourable member for his opportunity to reiterate what I said uh, previously, there is a fundamental understanding about the ongoing role of oil and gas in meeting our energy needs. Now, whether that is dealt with and satisfied through existing licences or future licences is a moot point. And I'll tell you why, Mr Deputy Speaker, because I've already demonstrated in as simple terms as I can that the implication that there is a direct and proportionate link between job security and licences issued is spurious. I am aware of the point the honourable gentleman is trying to make, but he is not making it well. I have told him what the situation is. He can either like it or he can lump it. Well, well I just like an answer. I mean, I have tried twice, and uh, that was as clear as mud. I, I think people looking at that will be actually unable to tell what the honourable gentleman's personal position is and the SNP party position is. And it's really important. And maybe it's telling the fact that only one SNP MP has turned up to a debate about the oil and gas sector. Well, I have seen the weather. I saw the weather when I left Inverness Airport at 6.45 uh, this morning. So I know what the weather's like uh, in Scotland. And I think it is important that when we are debating the oil and gas sector, the oil and gas industry that is crucial to Scotland and the United Kingdom, the SNP can only only find one MP to turn up. I'll give way. And will you accept that for the 90,000 employees in the gas, oil and gas industry in Scotland and the 200,000 across the United Kingdom, an answer that is a moot point is hardly the right answer to give, and it looks like it's a mute position which is being adopted by the, some of the opposition members here today? I absolutely agree with the Honourable Gentleman, and I think people will watch very closely uh, to what the Honourable Gentleman for Angus said on his own behalf and on behalf of the Scottish National Party. And as I say, they are speaking with their actions tonight uh, by not even turning up uh, at this, to this debate. Now, opponents to this bill, the Labour Party and the SNP uh, and others, tried to present our energy transition and uh, support for oil and gas as a binary affair. They say that you can't achieve our net zero goals while at the same time supporting new oil and gas licences and projects. But the simple truth is nothing could be further from the truth, because the oil and gas sector in Scotland and across the UK is absolutely essential to delivering and achieving net zero. The investment in green energy infrastructure that will allow us to build our renewables capacity is coming from the revenue from oil and gas extraction. The businesses that are looking to expand offshore wind and the wind farms for tomorrow are staying solvent today because of their revenues from North Sea oil and gas. And the skills and expertise that we have heard throughout this debate so far today that will be required to support our offshore renewables going forward currently work in our oil and gas sector today. And that is why it was so important that I made the point to the Right Honourable Gentleman to Doncaster North. People like Sir Ian Wood are saying that Labour's plans, the cliff edge that Labour would uh, uh, impose on the sector, will see job losses. Uh, and that is why that position is frankly unacceptable and is not supported uh, by many people, if anyone, in the north east of Scotland. And these uh, businesses, the investment and the jobs that make Scotland and the UK a world leader in oil and gas are the same skills, businesses and jobs that are going to drive forward the green agenda and our renewables future. We cannot have 
one without the other. We can't say to investors, businesses and workers to pause their plans for the UK's energy infrastructure through an artificial ban on new fields to come back when the green technologies have gotten cheaper eh, or more viable. Because those investors, those businesses and those workers will go elsewhere. Uh, and I say to the Honourable Gentleman for Angus, that is not a moot point. That is the reality uh, if we do not continue with the exploration of oil and gas in the North Sea and the granting of new licences. I will give way. Uh, I thank uh, my Honourable Friend for giving way. And, uh, he, I am sure, will join me in welcoming the, the vast number of offshore wind projects that are, are being developed off the coasts of our respective uh, constituencies, as well as the Honourable Member for Angus. And he'll welcome the operations and maintenance uh, facilities in Bucky and his constituency, Fraserburgh and mine, that are entirely dependent on those offshore wind facilities. But are, are, as, as much as pe people from the oil and gas industry are moving into those jobs, there just isn't the number of those jobs yet to be able to satisfy the jobs that we would lose in oil and gas. And as he says, or would he agree, that uh, a lot of these uh, people currently working in oil and gas jobs, if there's no oil and gas jobs, they won't go to renewables, they'll just go where there's oil and gas overseas. I absolutely agree with my uh, honourable friend, and uh, we've got uh, a base at Bucky Harbour uh, that is supporting uh, a number uh, of jobs, and will continue to, to support them for, for decades to come. It is a small number uh, at the moment, with opportunities to grow, uh, but at the moment, the vast majority of the workforce uh, are employed in the oil and gas sector. And as I say, uh, and I agree with my honourable friend, they will go elsewhere. They will shift jobs and expertise to other countries. Another city will become Europe's offshore energy capital. And that would be devastating, not just for our net zero eh, ambitions, not just for Aberdeen, but for the economy of Scotland and the UK as a whole. We have heard eh, already today in this debate that 90,000 Scottish workers eh, are employed in North Sea oil and gas. It has been one of the most important sectors for Scotland's economy for decades and will continue to be for, times, uh, for some time to come. Uh, and yet, the SNP member uh, opposite, and I believe it is his party's position, if more of them had turned up to, to state uh, their case, is to put these jobs on the scrap heap. They want to uh, have a cliff edge in our oil and gas sector and oil and gas uh, exploration because they are in government with the Greens uh, in the Scottish Parliament. They are uh, supporting uh, Green ministers who want to see uh, an immediate end to the extraction of fossil fuels from the North East. And that is uh, putting these 90,000 jobs at risk. It is putting Scotland and the UK's economy at risk. Uh, and that is something that is viewed extremely dimly in many parts of Scotland, but particularly the North East, where the Honourable Gentleman represents. I'll give way. Well, for the Honourable Gentleman and Mr Speaker, although it is a bit rich listening to a Scottish Tory MP talking about the bountiful experience of North Sea oil and gas for Scotland, where compared to what, what, what would have happened in the 70s if we had to have been independent, we would be embarrassingly well off compared to our neighbours elsewhere in these islands. But he says, he says Mr Speaker, that we want to throw workers in oil and gas industry in Scotland under a bus. He said we want to see a cliff edge where those jobs disappear. What is his evidence for that? Because actually, what we are investing in is a just transition where he is trying to pursue a, an endurance of legacy opportunities for employment. We want to turbocharge new opportunities for jobs going forward for 150, 200 years. This is, is very clear. In fact, it is the Honourable Gentleman's own words when he can't even tell this House or his constituents uh, about the SNP's position on the presumption of new oil and gas licences. That is an answer in itself, not a moot point. They don't support it. They clearly don't support it. He can't quite find the words to say that yet. But that is the SNP position, because in Holyrood, in government, in uh, Scotland, with the Greens in office, with the SNP, they are uh, increasingly um, abandoning the North East oil and gas sector, the jobs that rely on that, the jobs that rely uh, on that sector. Uh, and as I say, that is viewed extremely dimly, not just in the North East, but right across Scotland. I'll go for you to the honourable lady. Nobody is talking about turning off oil and gas taps overnight. Nobody, not even just stop oil. So would he just cut? The amount of rubbish, frankly, that is coming out of his mouth right now, criticising people who aren't here in, in any numbers saying. to be able to actually defend themselves. Why don't you just focus on his own record rather than attacking others in such an erroneous way? 
It's, it's not erroneous because we know that the, the co-leaders of the Scottish Green Party, uh, Patrick Harvey, has actually said he would like to, to stop the exploration of oil and gas uh, overnight. That's the Green position, to, to do that. So, so they don't want to uh, have oil and gas coming out of the North Sea, and they, that will affect the jobs there right now. And that's the point I have been making, and indeed members across the chamber have been making. Well, I, I have given way to the Honourable Lady already, and I can see copious notes in her hands, so she will be able to speak and contribute to this debate. Uh, but I have taken some time uh, from the Chamber uh, already and I want to uh, continue uh, with my speech because obviously uh, we have this situation where the SNP will put these jobs on the scrap heap, they will turn their back uh, on the northeast of Scotland. Yet at the same time, you've got Hamza Youssef telling the people of Scotland that revenues from oil and gas will pay for an independent Scotland going forward. So they don't want to uh, take the oil and gas uh, out, but they want to get the benefits of it to pay for their failing public services in Scotland that have been let down uh, by the SNP in power uh, for 17 years. And of course, Labour uh, and Scottish Labour uh, are also uh, opposed to this bill. Uh, and uh, it's frankly um, uh, quite derisory uh, that we now have uh, MSPs and um, uh, the Scottish Labour Party who will also not stand up for uh, the North East of Scotland and will allow these jobs and the skills uh, and the expertise that has been gained for decades uh, to be lost. There is uh, a stark reality here that, we work, that the opposition parties are putting at risk tens of thousands of Scottish jobs, putting the UK's energy security in jeopardy at a time when we need it most, when illiberal, violent regimes like Putin's Russia are using energy resources as a means to fund their destructive wars, we cannot close our eyes and our ears and pretend that is not happening. The UK will still have a demand for oil and gas products, not just in energy, but also, as we have heard, in plastics and medicines, to name just a few. And that demand will not go away in an instant. So many of our homes uh, today that require these products and heating will require them for many years to come. Why should we not be trying to deliver as much demand as possible through domestic production as we can, rather than importing our energy? which will only increase emissions further and help those intent on manipulating energy markets for malign purposes. So I urge members to support the bill today. Let's secure the UK's energy future and deal a blow to the regimes who are intent on using energy as a weapon. Let's protect our economy and the livelihoods of tens of thousands of Scottish and British families across the country. Let's choose common sense, a practical transition to net zero not naivety and wishful thinking. At the moment, the Labour and the SNP members opposite are going to oppose the bill. So let them explain in their speeches that we're about to hear why the SNP and Labour will join together tonight to vote down this bill and vote down the opportunities that oil and gas continues to bring Scotland and the UK for decades to come. Thank you. Damien Griffith. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, I rise to oppose uh, the Government's offshore petroleum licensing bill, a bill for which there is absolutely no need, a bill which will do absolutely nothing to bring down people's energy bills, either domestic or business, and a bill which will severely damage the UK's reputation in the world. Moreover, as I understand, uh, production from these new fields would actually be exported. Now, I was very privileged to have the opportunity when Labour was in government to work with my right honourable friend, the member for Leeds Central, on the Climate Change Act. A world first. It was groundbreaking. It led the way on tackling climate change. And of course, my right honourable friend, the member for Doncaster North, became the Secretary of State for the Department of Energy and Climate Change, not only working hard on renewables at home, but ensuring that the UK was taking the lead on the world stage in respect of climate change. And now, just as there has been a growing consensus across the globe on the urgency to tackle climate change, it seems that we have a government that no longer wants to give that leadership. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we even see that petroleum-producing countries like Oman are now investing very heavily in renewables. But we have a Prime Minister who is not even sure if he wanted to attend COP meetings. We have a vacuous anti-green rhetoric and now we have this bill. Here, here. 
It makes the UK look ridiculous, not to say hypocritical, hypocritical. on the world stage, mm -hmm. that with the proud history of urging other nations to do more to tackle climate change and to reduce reliance on fossil fuels and sign the agreements to that effect, including the recent one at COP28, the UK is now prioritising a bill to promote the exploration of more oil fields with production at who knows what future date. Now, what the government should be doing is prioritising the rollout of renewables. So often, during questions, we hear the Energy Minister boasting about the rollout of renewables. But in reality, he should be reflecting on how much more the UK could and should have done by now. Now, first there was the wind farm, bar, the wind farm ban in England. And even now, when they talk as if they're beginning to lift the ban, the situation is completely ambiguous, and there's been no enthusiastic promotion <coughs> of wind power by the government. Just think, if there'd not been a ban in England, we would have had additional capacity on top of what Wales and Scotland provide, and capacity nearer to the big centres of population, because we all know that the government has not moved fast enough to strengthen the national grid to transport the electricity from the wind farms where it's produced to the centres of population. And then we have the fiasco of the last auction process, AR5, where the government did not receive a single bid for floating offshore wind. Why? Because of their stubborn refusal to sit down with the industry and to recognise the huge impact of inflation and the need to alter the price structure accordingly. The Irish government listened to the industry and conducted a, su a successful au auction. And then, Mr Deputy Speaker, the complacency of the Minister when he came to this House and he said, oh well, there's another chance to bid for next year. Not just losing very valuable time, but sending very worrying signals to the industry about the Absolutely commitment right. of this government to developing floating offshore wind. And as we've heard from my honourable friend for Rotherham, there is investor lack of confidence Absolutely. now in investing in the UK because they simply don't know which direction this government yeah, is yeah. going in. Yeah. Now, we, I could go on. Uh, we have seen, uh, we could have seen a lot more progress with solar and a lot more progress mm. with marine technologies. Yeah. Just to take one example, um, that instead of um, wasting time on this bill, if the government really listened to the industry, these are some of the things that they could be doing. So the one example I'm going to quote is from the UK Marine Energy Council and what they've identified as the barriers to the rollout of tidal stream energy. Lack of clarity on future support, which is damaging investor confidence. Consenting process, which is slow and onerous. A lack of innovation funding. The cost of setting up supply chains and a lack of grid capacity. Now, that could be repeated by many other of the emerging renewable technologies. And that's where the government's energy should be concentrated, not on this ridiculous bill. And then we get to the issue of electrification of the railways. When Labour left government in 2010, there were plans to electrify the line from London to Swansea. Then we had the ridiculous pantomime of the Tories cancelling, cancelling Cardiff to Swansea, reinstating it and cancelling it again with the right on member for Carmarthen West and South Pembrokeshire, who was then Secretary of State for Wales and is now the Chief Whip, saying it was pointless as the nature of the track meant trains would not go any faster. But that completely misses the point, Mr Deputy Speaker. If you have been in the square in front of the station in Cardiff, the pollution, the carbon emissions and the noise from the diesel engines tells you exactly why we should be putting on with electrification, uh, pushing on with electrification to reduce our emissions. And instead, what do we have? We have this bill mm -hmm. to extract more oil and gas from the North Sea instead of moving away, moving away by producing renewables, moving away by ensuring that our industries and our uh, transport can operate on clean energy. Yeah. That's where the government priorities should be. And as for jobs, well, the people working in the oil and gas industry do indeed have very, very valuable skills. We must make absolutely sure that they have the opportunity to move across to other similar industries, renewables and infrastructure, and for that, the government needs a clear industrial strategy and proper retraining opportunities for those who need it. And, of course, the way to improve those job opportunities is to ramp up the speed and the scale of the development of renewables. 
There was a question earlier about Labour's policy. Well, I won't keep you here to read all 22 pages <coughs> which you can find on our website <coughs> about our plans to make the UK a super energy power. But the point is we are absolutely committed. So in brief, Mr Deputy Speaker, absolutely committed to slashing people's energy bills uh, by making the UK a renewable energy superpower, to creating the new green jobs of the future and to ensuring a just transition. And if we win the next election, then we will create a GB Energy to be a publicly owned champion in clean energy generation. We have plans for a National Wealth Fund, which will invest alongside the private sector in the jobs of the future, such as in clean steel plants. And our plans are underpinned by a proper <coughs> industrial strategy, which will give investors confidence. So on that note, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would suggest that the government drops this bill and turns its attentions and its energies to developing our renewable sector and to making sure that we can proudly lead the world on a just transition to a fossil-free world. Gideon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. We all want a healthier planet and a sustainable future for the next generations. But no one wants the heating to go off, the lights to go out, or for our energy security to be at the mercy of foreign players in an ever more unstable world. Yeah. This bill recognises that doing nothing and increasing our reliance on imported gas, including gas with uh, four times the emissions, is not the solution. So I'm glad that the government acknowledges the need to move away from oil and gas production, and I welcome our long-term commitment to drive down the use of fossil fuels and the significant and growing investment in the renewable sector which is the only way to guarantee our energy security for the future. But it is for the future. As a country, we are now home to five of the largest offshore wind farms in the world, diversifying our energy supply and reducing our reliance on, carbon, on fossil fuels. Renewables gained more power in 2022 to avoid the need for five times as much gas as the UK imported from Russia in 2021. But it is how we make this transition whilst preserving our reputation as a global leader in the fight against climate change that we should reflect on as we discuss this bill. I'm keen to see further efforts to reassure perceptions amongst the international community and my constituents who care about the environment that we are not rowing back on our climate and environmental commitments. Our current requirements are lower than rec uh, recommended pathways to reach net zero so I suggest we continue to strengthen the operational emission requirements for UK oil and gas producers. A recent report from Robert Gordon University found that 90% of the UK's oil and gas workforce had skills that were transferable to the offshore renewable sector. A well-managed transition helps ensure that more investment and more of these jobs stay in the UK. Those on the opposite benches have no plan. Labour ignore the, the, the country's needs, uh, energy needs in their opposition to this bill and the SNP, which seeks to enable a transition pathway for an industry which last year produced an average 42% of gas on an average day in Britain. Without new development, we will see greater reliance on imports, which the instability in the European market as a result of Putin's war is at best unwise. The party opposite talk of expanding renewables and reducing usage through measures such as insulation, an ambition which the government shares, but which is impossible to deliver at speed in areas such as Stoke-on-Trent, where there are many, many, well, if you'd listen, I'll give you the reason why, many terraced houses where the cost of insulating a property to the highest EPC standard can be greater than the value of the property itself. There needs to be a broader discussion about housing for this reason. Um, I refer to my uh, register of, of members' interests. Um, I recently visited Norway, the Conservative Environment Network, to see how they're using the skills and expertise of the oil and gas industry to develop carbon capture and storage facility at the Northern Lights project. For the world to achieve the goals that we have committed ourselves to in the Paris Agreement, we need large-scale carbon capture and storage. Not all emissions can be cut by applying renewable energy. Oil and gas will be needed for the foreseeable future. 
However, reducing fossil fuel demand is key to reaching net zero. In several industrial processes, such as production of cement, carbon capture and storage is the only technology that can cut emissions, reduce the need for imported energy and benefit households through less volatile and ultimately lower energy costs. About a fifth of emissions... I'll give She's talking about the enormous costs of um, insulation, but is she actually clear that carbon capture and storage is also enormously expensive? Well, I'm clear, I'm clear that lots of things have a cost, but we have to look at the cost of, of not doing these things. Um, so we're not talking, we're not talking about pure, pure financial cost here. So, so I wanted to go back to um, talking about the experience of, of what I learned from, from my trip to Norway. About a fifth of emissions from the North Sea oil and gas production activities comes from flaring, which I'm sure she'll agree with. We could follow Norway's ban on these activities, using this bill to bring forward our commitment to stop flaring. Removing gas... I mean, may, maybe... She, uh, please, I would like to, to get on, if the, if the Honourable Lady doesn't mind. So... Um, and she chunters from a sedentary position. Removing gas is necessary for, secure, for safety. However, it can be captured rather than burnt, which is my argument. We are in the midst of a paradigm shift in the production, storage and supply of energy and are faced with a range of innovative options to decarbonise whilst maintaining an adequate energy supply and reducing usage. None of this happens overnight. And whilst we welcome the possibilities that innovations such as less energy wastage through battery storage or alternative fuels such as hydrogen and future solutions such as the expansion of nuclear and alternatives such as tidal and geothermal energy, we do need this transition position. So I will be supporting the Bill at second reading, but we'll look in report stage at possibilities for reconfirming our commitment to minimise environmental damage and continue focusing on the end game of cleaner solutions to our energy needs. Barry Gardner. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I refer to my entry in the Register of Interest. Mr Deputy Speaker, I know you were not around at the time, but you will know that the Stone Age did not end because of a lack of stone, and the Oil Age will not end because of a lack of oil. It will end because decent people of all political persuasions, like the former Right Honourable Member for Kingswood, are far-sighted enough to recognise and brave enough to stand up against the vested interests that would consign our children and the natural world to a costly, disruptive and, frankly, terrifying future. He was right to say that history will judge harshly those who continue down the reckless fossil fuel path that this bill represents. This bill is founded upon a lie. In fact, several lies. The government says it will safeguard our domestic energy supplies and boost investment. It will not. They say it will enhance our energy security and reduce our dependence on imports from overseas. It will not. The truth is, it is a political distraction that will reduce investment in and delay our transition to the clean energy, which is the only sustainable and secure future, both for our country and for the global community. This bill is not a credible plan to fix Britain's broken energy system. It is a sad attempt to sow division and polarise our politics. It shows that the government has given up governing and is out of step with the British people's priorities. When six million people live in fuel poverty, when last winter 4,700 people died as a result of living in cold, damp homes, this bill falls well below what our constituents deserve. As the world's hottest year on record was concluding, nearly 200 countries agreed at COP28 to transition away from fossil fuels. The contrast between the promise made in Dubai and what the government seeks to do today could not be more profound, yes, yes. nor more depressing. By inviting Parliament to enable annual licensing rounds for offshore oil and gas extraction, the government is failing to understand that 
to transition away from fossil fuels, you have to stop producing them. <laughs> the government argued, but it is still a declining field. This simply slows the rate of decline, they say. The problem is that it also slows the rate of investment in a just transition that will unleash the power of wind, solar, tidal and energy efficiency. The North Sea is a declining basin. It res its reserves are predominantly oil, not gas. Between now and 2050, new licences are expected to provide just 103 days of gas. That's four days' worth of gas on average each year. The government knows that once oil and gas is licensed, it then belongs to the companies that hold that licence. And as the government recently admitted to my honourable friend, the member for Brighton Kemp Town, 80% of UK oil reserves are sent abroad by these companies and sold on the international market to the highest bidder. No wonder the former executive director of BP said last year that the government's decision to expand North Sea drilling, and I quote, is not going to make any difference to Britain's energy security. If the government's ambition is to minimise gas imports, then there is a very simple solution. Insulate homes. The best way to cut imports is to reduce domestic fossil fuel consumption by building renewables and insulating homes. This would have the additional benefit of reducing people's energy bills and tackling fuel poverty. By channeling investment into oil and gas, it is heading precisely in the wrong direction. Now, I, I do not deny there is a role for existing oil and gas, but it is in the journey to a clean energy economy. What there is not a role for is the production of new oil and gas. We already know that to stand a 50% chance of keeping below the 1.5 degree threshold, 90% of the world's coal reserves and 60% of oil and gas reserves would have to stay in the ground. The logic of... I, I, I will give way to the Honourable. I just wondered if he's aware of... He mentioned the, the pathway to um, the one and a half degree target, and the IEEA's uh, description of what is required to be three to four percent reduction in oil and gas production year, uh, year on year between now and 2050. Does he agree with the assessment of the NSTA themselves, who, who expect that even with the new oil and gas licence, North Sea oil and gas is, is predicted to decline by seven percent, twice that amount? I, I'm well aware of that. Of course I am. Um, but he will have heard the discussion that, that's taken place uh, earlier uh, about global leadership. He will, have, he will know that actually other countries around the world are not declining at the required rate. Uh, and actually leadership is about taking a lead. Um, the logic of drilling for more when the world has already more than it can safely burn is that of the myopic salesman, not the visionary politician. Or to use the Prime Minister's words, it's the logic of the zealot. The government's actions are already making the UK a less attractive place for green investment. Mm. Three quarters of all North Sea oil and gas operators currently invest nothing in UK renewables at all. The largest operator, Harbour Energy, has ruled such clean investment out altogether. Yet last year, the five oil super majors, BP, Shell, Chevron, ExxonMobil and Total Energies, rewarded their investors with record payouts of more than £79 billion. Pounds. So we know the money is there to do it. The Minister is asking whether I will give way. Um, the Right Honourable Member has, has long confused the, the scoring of party political points with the ability to debate an issue in order to arrive at the truth and get decent policies out the other end. But if he's changed the habit of a lifetime, 
I'll happily give way to. Well, I thank the honourable gentleman. I just thought, as he mentioned the specific company of Harbour Energy, that they are uh, absolutely investing in the Viking carbon capture. Um, centre and are playing a positive role, and that is true of the whole oil and gas supply chain, which in this country, if the honourable gentleman went and visited them, he would find that they are working right across the energy sector and weakening one part, as he would with no new licences, damages the clean emerging sectors too. Can, can I say to the Minister, um, I recognise the work that, that Harbour Energy are doing, and I also recognise the work that the government's done in trying to attract more investment into green energy and renewables. And, and I welcome that work. I want us to have a cross-party consensus around getting to net zero. The trouble is, and he knows this to be true, that he and many people on his side, including the Prime Minister, have actually tried to make this a wedge issue, a political issue, to divide people. And I think he really does need to step up to the plate. If he wants cross-party consensus, then he has to try and build it, not score cheap political points. Um, of course, I'll give away. So, so the Liberal Democrats were actually introducing um, a, an amendment to stop flaring and vent, venting of methane. The Honourable Member for Stoke Central has just said it would be a, a very good thing to do, and yet the government opposed it. Is that ju just not exactly where we could have reached cross-party consensus? Well, the Honourable Lady is absolutely correct. Um, and I, I, I listened to the, the attempt at the intervention uh, on, on the colleague uh, uh, across the way. But this is the way in which we need to build a cross-party consensus, because actually, you know, there are really concerned members on the government benches who do want to do the right thing. And we all know sometimes the whips make sure that they don't. Um, but actually, if we really build this consensus, we can get to the right place. Look, another lie at the heart of this bill is to say it will protect British jobs. It won't. Over the years, there have been hundreds of thousands of jobs in the oil and gas sector and its supply chain. They've kept our lights on and our industry moving for decades, just as the coal miners did before them. But pretending that employment in oil and gas can last forever fails to properly prepare those workers and their families for the inevitable transition that the world is making. Despite sustained support for the North Sea Basin over the past 14 years, despite 400 new drilling licences being issued across five separate licensing rounds, the fact is that more than 200,000 jobs in the wider oil and gas industry and its wider supply network have been lost. Today, 30,000 hard-working people are directly employed in the industry. These workers and the local economies they uphold need a coherent plan to move past fossil fuel production towards clean energy. The trouble is the government has not developed one. There are further 100,000 individuals who are supported through the supply chain, waiting, waiting for a signal from government so they can seize the opportunities of the clean energy revolution. This bill offers them nothing. The bill seems to override the already weak non-binding climate compatibility checkpoint. The production emissions reduction target as set out in the North Sea transition deal is already weak setting out a cut of only 50% by 2030. This bill seems to weaken it even further. It includes no reference as to how, low, uh, as to how annual licensing will be judged against the NSTD targets for production emissions, let alone emissions from combustion. Critically, the bill ignores the wider environmental consequences of development of new fields, and it puts marine habitats at risk. Over a third of the 900 locations in the latest licensing round overlapped with marine protected areas. And yet this directly contradicts the commitment the UK made at the Convention on Biological Diversity Conference COP15 in Montreal, where we promised to protect 30% of UK waters for nature by 2030. The Rosebank Field, which was recently licensed, sees a pipeline run through the Faroe Shetland Marine Protected Area, which threatens ocean life. 
If a major oil spill from Rosebank were to happen, 20 MPAs could be seriously impacted. This bill is an attack on nature, both by its indirect impact through increasing emissions, but also its direct impact on the marine environment. The government appear to believe they know better than the International Energy Agency, the United Nations Secretary General, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and hundreds of the world's leading scientists, all of whom are clear that new oil and gas licenses jeopardize further the goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius. This Parliament's own independent advisor, the Committee on Climate Change, confirmed to Parliament only last year that the expansion of fossil fuel production is not in line with net zero and that the oil and gas fuel that is required in the UK as we make that journey to net zero does not require the development of any new fields. But what I find most depressing about this bill is not its arrogance, it's not its ignorance, it's the way it seeks to break with the cross-party consensus for the sake of creating a party political dividing line in advance of a general election. That dividing line pretends that the rational, informed, scientific view is held only by what the Prime Minister calls climate zealots and it tries to establish the recalcitrant fossil fuel lobby that is endangering all that we hold dear across the globe as the reasonable middle ground. It is not. As the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. The fossil fuel lobby is behaving like the tobacco lobby did when all the medical evidence was evinced against it. First, deny the science outright. When that is no longer credible, pretend that the concern is exaggerated. And when that is no longer credible, reframe the issue as one of personal choice. Government is about establishing a framework of regulation for the public good. It's not about facilitating the freedom of those who would undermine the public good. That is why this bill is bad for democracy. That is why this bill is bad for our global standing as a country that has previously been regarded as a leader on this issue. That leadership is now passing to others who are responding positively to the pledge in Dubai to transition away from fossil fuels by joining the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. The floods we are seeing devastate communities and lives around the country are but a foretaste of the terrifying impacts of climate change beyond 1.5 degrees. This bill does nothing to mitigate them. It does nothing to support the billions of people across the world who live on the front lines of climate breakdown. It ignores the plight of millions of bill payers who find themselves priced out of our broken energy system, and it ignores the workers who power our country. This bill endangers our natural world and future generations. I cannot support it. I'll consign it to the same vote of no confidence that I predict awaits this government later on this year. David again. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, can I start by uh, saying something uh, to the House in the interest of transparency and remind the House that for 25 years prior to being an MP, I worked in the energy sector, specifically in the oil and gas sector, uh, and also in the interest of transparency. I haven't made a secret of that in the past, by the way. Uh, but also in the interest of transparency, uh, I have a family member, a close family member, who has a financial interest in that industry, although that interest, I feel... Uh, uh, keen to point out, is below the threshold required for registered interests. I can also assure the House that that interest has never had any bearing and will, will not have any bearing on my contributions in this place. Yeah. We are not a nation that needs to be convinced of the need to transition away from oil and gas. As my right honourable friend, the Energy Minister, said on his return from COP28, and he was, uh, well, and I quote, Proud, he was proud to represent a country that has cut greenhouse gas emissions more than any other major economy since 1990, 
that has boosted our share of renewable electricity from a rather dismal 7% in 2010 to almost 50% today. In fact, we have exceeded 50% since I think he said that. Uh, while, I continue the quote, while almost entirely phasing out coal, coal power that has led the world in mobilising clean finance and that is now ensuring that we bring the British public with us on the transition to net zero. We have essentially transitioned away completely from coal to continue to reduce our demand, our demand for oil and gas but not as fast as our own domestic supplies continue to decline, even with new production. One of the critical points that needs to be made when considering this legislation is that new oil and gas does not mean more oil and gas. It is important to state a few basic facts that will hopefully help people understand why this bill, aimed at promoting and facilitating new oil and gas production in this country, is not in contradiction to delivering on our net zero targets and global agreements and commitments. We are today 75 per cent dependent on oil and gas for our energy needs, not just for electricity generation, but for heat and transportation as well. Of that 75 per cent, about 50 per cent is produced domestically, with the rest needing to be imported, including from Norway, as Honourable Lady mentioned earlier. But even by 2050, we will be at net zero and still up to 25 per cent dependent on oil and gas. And even with new oil and gas exploration and production, Coupled with that decline in demand, we are extremely unlikely to ever have a net surplus ever again. The UK has been, in fact, a net importer of oil and gas since 2004, long after our own production profile peaked in the late 1990s. There are currently 283 active oil and gas fields in the North Sea, and it is estimated by the Offshore Energies UK trade body by 2030, around 180 of those, which is over 60 per cent of the current number, will have ceased production due to natural decline. And if we do not replace those depleting oil and gas fields with new ones, then production will decline much faster than we are currently able to build low-carbon sources to replace it. It is worth remembering that even with all the new oil and gas fields, as I pointed out earlier, with the, with the new oil and gas fields in Wales, we can reasonably predict we are still looking at a 7 per cent year-on-year reduction in UK production, according to the North Sea Transition Authority. And that's twice as fast as recommended by the International Energy Agency, who suggests that the global reduction of oil and gas production needs to be about half of that, at 3 to 4 per cent a year, to stay within our 1.5 degree uh, target. In line with the Climate Change Committee's balanced pathway, the UK's demand for oil and gas will reduce over time and is forecast to be approximately 16 billion barrels of oil equivalent, cumulative through to 2050. That's 16 16 billion barrels over that period. Exi but existing domestic fields are expected to deliver only between 4 and 6 billion barrels of oil equivalent. So you can see the gap. That gap represents the import gap, the gap that we need to fill through imports. New field developments and new licences are required to reduce our reliance on overseas imports. Without new investment, it is predicted that reliance on overseas imports will increase from 50 per cent today to closer to 80 per cent by 2030. If we are going to continue to have a demand, and we are going to continue to have a demand, albeit declining, for oil and gas in the coming de decades, then it makes sense to get it from as close to our own shores as possible. Reducing demand for oil and gas is key, not the supply, reducing demand. And I think we can all agree that that is something we all need to do. But simply reducing, simply reducing or cutting off our domestic supply will not help net, net zero happen any faster or any more successfully. It will only make us more dependent on foreign imports. But there are other factors to consider. We have all heard today of the 200,000 or so jobs that are dependent on the oil and gas industry. That is directly uh, employed by the oil and gas industry. And of course, protecting those jobs, people's livelihoods, and the, understand, and the understanding of the impact. Uh, an industry has on communities and societies, as well as to our local and national economies, is extremely important. But my biggest worry goes beyond that. It is not necessarily that those people will become unemployed. Some of those people may indeed find jobs in the burgeoning renewable sector. And as uh, I discussed earlier with my honourable friend from Murray, so we see it, we're seeing that in our constituencies. I'll Although in the short to medium term, there, won't be a, there isn't enough of those renewable jobs to go around. What I am most concerned about is the potential loss of the skills, technologies, supply chains, and precisely the skills, technologies and supply chains that will be crucial to the delivery of the energy transition. 
If we shut down this critical industry too soon, those skills and supply chains will merely go overseas and deliver someone else's energy security and someone else's energy transition. For the last 50 years, the North Sea offshore in industry has, seen, has been seen as a centre of excellence in the global oil and gas industry. Nowhere, nowhere in the world is oil and gas produced safer, more efficiently, cleaner and more environmentally responsible. It was the right hon. Member, the, the former, now former member of Kingswood who said, and I, and I think my right hon. Friend, the, uh, the member for uh, uh, Reading, Reading West, um, who said as well earlier, we are a clean energy superpower. We have decarbonised faster than any, any other G20 nation. We have reduced our emissions by 50 per cent. At the same time, we have grown our economy 70 per cent above 1990 levels. And that is, and again, I quote the former, former member for Kingswood, for Kingswood, that is a paragon and a model which other nations look to. But where the member, former member for Kingswood and I did not agree is that far from damaging that re reputation that we have built over decades, we have the opportunity to maintain and build upon that perception of being a centre for excellence, not just for producing oil and gas better, safer and cleaner than anyone else, not just for decarbonising faster than anyone else, and certainly not just for virtue signalling better than anyone else, as the opposition appear to be seeking to do. I welcome this bill and I welcome the increased certainty it brings to the offshore energy industry, the businesses and the people with the skills and talent working in those companies who will help not only deliver our energy security for years to come, but will also deliver a successful energy transition to net zero, not just showing the world that it can be done, but showing the world by leading the world in how it can be done. Kenny McCaskill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I have to say I agree with a lot of what the uh, Honourable Member for Banff and Buchan has said, even although I disagree with the purpose of this bill, which seems to me to be political grandstanding indicative only of it being an election year entirely failing to serve the significant needs of those who are struggling to heat their homes in Scotland at the present moment, of meeting the needs of the Scottish economy that should be basking in all the glory and the wealth that has been created through oil and gas, and indeed also of failing to address the needs of our wider planet. Uh, there is, of course, a need to transition. That is self-evident. It's not simply the global warming that members were talking about. The trains in my constituency were cancelled today. The A1 was closed today because a lorry was overturned. An HGV vehicle, not a high-sided one. It was the strength of the winds that battered the communities in my own constituency and indeed elsewhere. We have serious problems coming down the line and we do require to change. But it requires to be a just transition. It requires to be done at a pace that allows us to change because we do have to ensure that we keep those skills we cannot do to those in the oil and gas sector what was done by Thatcher to the miners and simply close them down and throw them to the wolves. We have to ensure that we also transition towards renewables, and that does require the oil and gas, because it does take oil and gas to make that journey. I can see it in the hills of the Lammermuirs. I can see it on a daily basis as the increased wind turbines go into the Firth of Forth. But at the end of the day, the ships that are currently tracking and putting in the columns and the turbines run on marine diesel. A lot of the uh, turbines require plastics to be constructed, and we also require the vehicles simply to get them there. So we do have to get to that renewable future. Indeed, the tragedy in Scotland is already there in producing almost as much energy as we require. Our people just don't get the benefit of it because it's transmission south and their charts at an appalling rate when it should be almost free, given that they can see it from their homes, on their hills and indeed off their shores. But there has to be a change. There is also the perversity coming, because I do agree with new licensing, but what we are seeing in Rosebank is it is going to be operated and owned by Equinor, the state energy company of Norway. The profits are going to go to Oslo. Scotland and Norway discovered oil at the same time because we share that access to the North Sea Basin. Norway has got a standard of living and an economy that those in Scotland can only look at and weep with envy. They have also got a futures fund because they have put the money away, not allowed the super rich to get even richer investing in foreign bank accounts or indeed Highland estates. They have got a futures fund that Scotland has precisely nothing. But we do have to continue building. 
I do believe that we have to have continued extraction of oil and gas, but it has to be at a pace that is significant for Scotland, that also takes into account the needs of the global planet and a requirement to meet it. But it also has to have two particular aspects. First of all, as per the written amendment in the name of both myself and my group leader here, Neil Hanvey, the MP for Kirkcaldy and Cowdenbeef, we have to have a commitment to net zero carbon footprint. And in particular, that means taking into account the needs of carbon capture. Because Scotland's had the bounty of North Sea oil, we need to make sure that we continue to get benefit from it. We've got the bounty coming of renewable, and we see it in offshore wind, floating and indeed fixed. But we also have huge potential with carbon capture, because the geology of the North Sea provides something like 30% of the opportunities in Europe, and so Scotland has to benefit from carbon capture. Yes, it's untested, but our, our society and our planet needs it. But more importantly, we do have a, to have a commitment to a refinery at Grangemouth being retained. It is absurd, as others have said today, that the oil from the North Sea is transshipped abroad in the main to be refined, and then we import from other super tankers coming in, passing them the high seas. That is simply absurd. As we have a worsening planet crisis, it is perverse. It's not good enough to say it's the wrong type of oil. No more than we'd accept it from a real operating company that it was the wrong type of leaves on the tracks. Yes, our refineries are not at the capacity of the engineering or the technical skills to be able to refine it. That should be done. The first place to do it is in Grangemouth. Why in Grangemouth? Because the Forties pipeline comes into Grangemouth. It lands, as the member for Banff and Buckin knows, in Cruden Bay in his constituency, but it's piped down to 40, the Forties pipeline down to uh, Grangemouth. It is absurd that Grangemouth should be closing when the oil is coming in from the North Sea, both past, present, and indeed future. So if there is to be this continued extraction of Scotland's need that we have not benefited from because we don't have the wealth or savings that Norway has, we have to at least ensure that we save Grangemouth. I call upon the UK Government to ensure that they provide the funds, first of all, to provide for the hydro cracker that will increase the profitability of the existing site threefold. If that is done, and it is a fraction of what the UK has taken in terms of the billions it's got from North Sea oil over the years. It's a fraction of what it will continue to take in petroleum revenue tax and other benefits in coming years. What we have to ensure is we get the profitability up. Then we have to make sure in a couple of years that we take the engineering and skills and then take the technology and we make sure that the oil from the North Sea can be refined in Grangemouth. It is absurd and perverse that that is not done and it requires to be a, a condition by all means if the member wants to. I thank the member for giving way. And would he accept that one of the reasons why we have not had investment in the refining industry in the United Kingdom for decades now? is precisely because of the net zero policies which are being followed, the cost and the charges for carbon, the emissions trading scheme and other carbon taxes which discourage any investment in the, the very production facilities which we use to process the oil that we bring out. I think there's a variety of factors. I've no doubt some of those factors are also there. There's also been a failure to invest. Where the blame doesn't lie is with a workforce that is skilled, that it has to work at the present moment with a refinery that is frankly past its sell by date and requires to be invested in. Even the union and the workforce will recognise that. It requires that investment to get the hydrocracker going and to get the technology to ensure that we refine the oil there. Those who have taken the benefit, and it's probably not the current owners Petroenios, it's been previous owners who have taken the wealth, invested in their shareholders, taken it for themselves and not put it back either into the workforce or indeed into the uh, capacity at the refinery. Tragedy, that's something that happens across so much of UK industry, whether the shipyards, whether steelworks or whatever else. But we are now seeing a government that is going to benefit from North Sea Oil's continued extraction. So what the least that Scotland's entitled to expect is that its refinery will be at the heart of it, especially when the oil is going to flow down that golden thread in the 40s pipeline down to Grangemouth, we require to ensure that Grangemouth will refine it. 
Yes, it requires technical changes. Yes, that will come at a cost, but it is a small fraction of what the UK is going to take from the benefit of that North Sea oil. That is why our support as a party is conditional upon carbon capture and the net zero footprint, but it's also conditional upon Grangemouth being at the heart. It is absurd that Scotland is not getting the wealth from the oil that is off its shores. It is absurd that countries have seen their desert redeveloped, have seen the desert bloom because of the oil that they've had. What we've seen with North Sea oil is an industrial desert created, and having been brought up only some 10 or 15 miles from Grangemouth, I know the devastation that will come to that community unless there are the changes required to ensure that it does the refining for North Sea oil. We cannot afford to have Grangemouth thrown to the wolves. And as in the debate earlier, previously last week, we cannot have Grangemouth no more. We require to ensure a refinery capacity. It would be absurd that Scotland and the UK would have in Grangemouth no refinery capacity. Scotland's 21st in the nations that have produced oil. We would be the only one in the top 25 that does not have a refinery capacity. Countries, the only other countries who tend to not have a refinery capacity are the likes of the Republic of Congo and Trinidad and Tobago. I wish those countries no ill. I'm sure they're fine countries, but they don't produce the same level of oil. They're not a developed industrial economy. And the fact of the matter is Scotland should not be in the same position that it's an oil producing nation without a refinery capacity. On that basis, Grangemouth might be retained, and I call upon the government to do that. The only additional point I will make, Mr Speaker, is that the Scottish Government too requires to step up to the plate. The fact of the matter that the Business and Economy Secretary in Scotland appears to be accepting the closure of Grangemouth as something that's just going to happen and is all maybe rather matter of regret is simply unacceptable. He may be in coalition with the Greens, but he cannot have them wagging the SNP dog. It is simply unacceptable that we see Grangemouth closed without a fight. The Scottish Government should be leading the demands that the refinery is changed that we do ensure the hydro cracker, that we do provide the changes to refine in Scotland, that we do move towards biofuels. What they shouldn't be doing is wringing their hands and selling the workforce in Grangemouth out. We require a refinery capacity in Scotland. The UK government's got the benefits of Scotland's oil and should pay for it. And it's about time that Scottish government stood up for industrial Scotland and the workers who at one point put their trust and faith in them. Mayhew. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, we're no strangers to hyperbole in this chamber, but uh, I think this debate has surprised even us in our ability to, to exaggerate the importance of this bill. Because to hear the, the members opposite, you would think that the government has made a bold announcement to reject its own policies on climate change, that it's denying the science, that it's minimising the impact of climate change, and that we're no longer committed to, to decarbonising by 2050, none of which is even remotely true. Nothing has changed in relation to the government's policy on climate change and decarbonisation in particular. In fact, the Prime Minister very recently reaffirmed them. The very substantial uh, marker that was passed just recently of the UK United Kingdom being the first economy any, of any major economy to more than halve its emissions. That is a huge milestone. That's the kind of climate leadership which is important, not making virtue signalling announcements in this chamber or elsewhere. Countries around the world look at us because of what we do, and what we're doing is decarbonising and leading by example. And I take no lessons from the, from the party opposite. When they were in power, I looked it up during the course of um, the debate, Mr Deputy Speaker, in 2010, under their watch, the economy emitted 495.8 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. Now it's 320 million tonnes and declining. That is as a result of conservative policies in action, where we accept the science on climate change, but we take positive actions on the really important thing, which is it's the amount of oil and carbon that we use that's important and not where it comes from. The Conservative record is incredibly strong on this, but we still recognise, as does the Committee on Climate Change, that we need oil and gas as part of our long-term future. 
currently, the, the, as the Honourable Member for Banff and Buchan has pointed out, we use about 75% uh, about of our energy comes from oil and gas, comes from hydrocarbons. That is reducing, but it's on a trajectory to get to about 25% even in 2050 and beyond. It's, I will go. I will go back. He's oh, taking no, the Committee on Climate Change's name in vain, it seems to me, because they do not say that we need new oil and gas. They absolutely categorically say that new, more explorations of oil and gas is not compatible with our net zero obligations. So I don't understand why he's claiming something different from what they say. And when he was talking about the figures comparing uh, emissions under a Labour government than under a Tory one. I'm no apologist for the Labour government, but I wonder if he'd actually put into that the calculations about consumption emissions. Did he actually work out whether or not emissions had gone down in the UK because we'd outsourced even more of our manufacturing to other countries on the other side of the world? Uh, um, for the intervention, the Commission on Climate Change gives us the science and it's the political decisions are taken in this House. And we're not talking about a, an increase in, in exploration. What we're talking about is a managed reduction, a reduction of 7% per annum. So moving on, we've, we've got the question here. It's not whether we have oil or gas, yes or no. We know that we need oil and gas certainly now, certainly for the period of transition between 2024 and 2050. But even beyond 2050, we're going to need about 25%, according to the Committee on Climate Change, of our energy uses are still going to come from oil and gas. So it's not oil and gas or yes or no. It's where should that oil and gas come from? So if we do need to supply this economy with oil and gas, it's my belief that we should use UK oil and gas, and there's reasons for that. The first reason, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that that industry employs 200,000 people. I would prefer for that employment to remain within the UK economy rather than exporting it to Russia or to Qatar or to Saudi Arabia or other oil producing and gas producing countries. I think that is a reasonable position given that our consumption is required for the future. The second reason is geopolitical. We need an alternative to Russian, in particular, gas in this country. But it's not just this country. I quite accept the points made earlier by members of the opposition that, uh, that oil and gas is a global market and that 80% of North Sea oil is, is um, exported to Europe. But emissions are global, but so are the geopolitics. It is right and it is in our strategic interest that Europe, in addition to the United Kingdom, has a viable alternative of hydrocarbons than Russia. We have seen in the last two years the awful consequences of an over-reliance on Russian supply of hydrocarbons, both for Europe, in fact, in, in, in more of a case for Europe and in particular Germany than for the United Kingdom. And we've become a net exporter of, uh, of gas to mainland Europe, a little bit from the North Sea, but a lot of it has come from um, Milford Haven. It's been Qatari liquid natural gas being imported into our country and then transported by the connectors to mainland Europe because they are sucking up very polluting liquid natural gas because they don't have a viable, cleaner alternative, which North Sea gas would provide. Yes, I will give away. I haven't heard David it today, but it has been pointed out to me that the gas produced in Qatar is produced at a broadly equivalent carbon footprint to ours. But it's the compression into liquid, the transportation, and then the deliquification uh, when it gets into this country that actually quadruples that carbon footprint. My honourable friends are absolutely right, and the, the members opposite have no answer to this. They, reckon, they know that through green misguided policies in Germany in particular, they've taken the extraordinary decision to decommission their, their low carbon nuclear industry and, and replace it with coal fired power station. You could hardly make it up. Um, but then, and then they are massively increasing their reliance on imported liquid natural gas, which is much more uh, polluting than a, a, a cleaner and more local alternative and a geopolitically more stable alternative, which would be North Sea gas and oil. Now, the third reason, Mr Deputy Speaker, why I would prefer that we use UK oil and gas is that it pays UK tax. 
Now, I'm not ashamed to say that I welcome that. I welcome, if we're going to have extraction of hydrocarbons that's going to pay tax, I would prefer that tax to be paid within the United Kingdom economy than in some other country. But just between 2023 last year and 2028, it's estimated that, that tax, those tax receipts will amount to £30 billion. £30 billion. We know how much trouble the members opposite are in in trying to explain where they're going to get their £28 billion of borrowing each year, how it's going to raise interest rates and increase debt and increase inflation. That will be more than doubled if they got their way and they refused uh, and they, they worked down, I will in a minute, and they, they uh, through their policies, uh, destroyed the uh, North Sea oil and gas sector. So I move away. He's mentioning um, what the government is spending or not spending or tax and so on and so forth. Can you just mention how much the government actually spends in subsidies for the oil and gas industry? Just a number for it. <laughs> there was, there was a, a number mentioned earlier. I didn't actually catch it in the course of this debate, but I'm sure the, the Honourable Lady may have that in mind. But it's quite right that we support, we support industries in this country because they create employment, they generate economic activity, and they in turn pay taxes. I'm not ashamed of that. I think that's a good thing. And the final reason, Mr Deputy Speaker, why I want to have oil and gas extraction in this country, if we're going to use it, is because of the balance of payments. Now, that used to be a very fashionable uh, economic argument back in the day. When I was a teenager, we used to have uh, uh, announcements on the news about the balance of payments month by month. What has happened to that? Because the balance of payments are every bit as important economically today as they were back in the 1980s. And we run a current account deficit in this country, about £150 billion. That is a huge number, and it will be exacerbated if we choose, and it would be a political choice, not to generate and then export uh, a product from this economy into a third economy, but choose to import one instead, exacerbating the balance of payments deficit twice over. So for those four reasons, I am wholly in favour of the ambitions behind this short bill. Climate change will be solved by the reduction of demand for hydrocarbons, not by the reduction of supply. And we're going to solve the demand problem by providing cheap alternatives, and the government is doing it. Those members who contributed uh, were quite right to highlight that. We, knew we need renewables. Yes, I will give away. I absolutely agree with the point uh, the Right Honourable Member is making about reducing demand. And that is, I think, the great travesty, is that we're still seeing houses built today and he'll see it, I'm sure, across his constituency, where the insulation is like that wide, that deep. That's ridiculous, isn't it? I couldn't agree more. Amazing. I absolutely could not agree more. The um, building regs come in in 2025, which uh, require a very significantly increased um, low-carbon uh, footprint for modern buildings. It's called better housing, I think. And uh, it's, it's deeply frustrating, personally, that that wasn't brought in earlier, and the sooner it comes in, the better, because we have, and then we have the 28 and a half million existing houses that we have, domestic houses in, in, in Britain, and the challenge of retrofitting uh, insulation. There have been some good points made by members office, opposite about the need to improve uh, the retrofitting, and, and there is scope for the government to incentivise further um, insulation of, of private houses to go in with the very successful uh, scheme that they have in place already for uh, public sector buildings and public sector housing. So we've also got to increase our wind uh, power. We've got an ambition a target of 50 gigawatts by 2030. That is uh, extremely ambitious. Uh, the current rate is about 17 gigawatts of, of wind, uh, renewable wind uh, power generation capacity at the moment and uh, increase solar and, yes, increase nuclear, including small modular reactors. Then we need better technology with uh, carbon capture usage and storage. We need to accelerate our use of uh, electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles or, frankly, any other kind of technology which solves the problem. And we need to incentivise the market and to step into this area. 
And we also need, whilst taking a step back looking at buildings, there's not just the, the operating costs of um, uh, uh, carbon costs of the existing infrastructure, which we are focusing on um, both in, in commercial buildings but also in the residential sector. But there's the embodied carbon in our construction processes, um, hence my private member's bill uh, relating to the measurement of embodied carbon in, in large um, buildings and, and large developments. Because if we don't, about 50% of the carbon associated with building is actually in its construction, not in its operation. So there's all these moving areas where the government is either ahead of the game or moving in the right direction. These are going to be successful and already have been in reducing demand for hydrocarbons. And I just do not understand, Mr Deputy Speaker, why it is that Labour appears to be putting virtue signalling before the economic impact and 200,000 jobs lately. I do not understand that. This is an eminently sens sensible bill, and I'll be supporting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In my four years as a Member of Parliament, I keep coming back to this question. Whose interests does this place serve? Are the laws we pass and the structures we maintain serving the interests of our constituents? Are they designed to enrich and empower them, or, they, or do they deepen inequalities in wealth and power, serving the interests of the super-rich and the companies that dominate our economy? And I say this, Mr Deputy Speaker, because with this bill, this question feels more relevant than ever. This bill, which scales up fossil fuel extraction in the North Sea, just as we should be rapidly scaling it down, is obviously not to help our constituents. It's not about bringing down energy bills. Even the Secretary of State has admitted to that. It's not about energy security. A former BP boss has said new, new North Sea drilling is, and I quote, not going to make any difference to energy security, which is no surprise since fossil fuel companies are given ownership of what they extract and then they sell it on the world market. And this bill is the very opposite of tackling the climate crisis. This is a blatant truth recognised by the government's own climate change committee, which said that this bill is not in line with net zero. So if this bill isn't about energy bills, energy security, or tackling the climate crisis, what is it about? Well, the answer is simple. It's about maximising profit for fossil fuel giants, guaranteeing that they can extract every last bit of oil and gas, no matter the consequence, for people and planet. And these companies are the last that need our support. As energy bills soared, and our constituents know that reality far too well, last year, BP's global profits hit £23 billion. Shell reported its highest ever profit, a whopping £32 billion. This year, the world's biggest five the biggest five oil companies are expected to hand investors more than £80 billion. Record bills for my Coventry South constituents have meant record profits for fossil fuel giants. And eye-watering North Sea oil and gas profits aren't an accident. They are by design. They are aided and abetted by government choices. The government's North Sea tax and subsidy regime is so skewed in the interests of fossil fuel companies that for years Shell and BP got away with paying zero tax on North Sea production. It is so rigged in these companies' interests that the company developing Rosebank Oilfield will get a £3 billion tax break to develop the site, meaning our constituents will pay for 91% of the cost of developing it. So the public pay the costs, the company creams off the profits, and then we all face the consequences of their climate wrecking activity. And there is no doubt about that because the science is clear. Developing new oil and gas fuels is incompatible with our climate commitments. So Mr Deputy Speaker, more oil and gas extraction may be good for fossil fuel companies and their shareholders, but it spells disaster for the rest of us. Because if we continue to let the climate crisis deteriorate, we condemn our constituents to a world where extreme weather patterns become more common and more severe, where there are more storm hanks and more storm eashes, where their winds blow harder and their floods get deeper. We condemn young people across the country to a world where droughts destroy crops and food systems break down, where sea levels rise and millions are di displaced. Mr Deputy Speaker, that is the world that this climate wrecking bill is helping to create. But there is an alternative, and it's called a Green New Deal, a programme of state-led investment in green industries, rapidly replacing fossil fuels with renewables, creating millions of good, unionised green jobs, taxing the richest and redistributing wealth and power in the favour of ordinary people. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, unlike this bill, that is a plan that puts people and planet before profit, and there is no time to waste. So I urge colleagues to vote against this climate wrecking bill and build that brighter alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Ford. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I suspect for many members of this colleague of this House, there are times when votes in this place can cause a sleepless night or two. And for me, this vote has caused a number of sleepless nights. There's a dilemma. On one hand, the responsibility to care for the lives and livelihoods of those people that we represent today. On the other hand, the responsibility to care for those who will come in the future and to leave the planet in a better place for the generations that will come ahead in the times ahead. On one hand, there's the risk to our energy security, a much greater risk than any of us would have predicted just a couple of years ago due to the war in Ukraine, the situation in the Middle East, the Red Sea, and who knows what next. The government's right on the energy security that we can't move away from fossil fuels overnight. We do need to prioritise energy security for so long as we need those fossil fuels. Importing LNG involves much greater emissions than using gas extracted here. Relying on, on overseas energy means jobs overseas, not British jobs. But then, on the other hand, there's the risk of climate change. In my Essex constituency, the summer before last, we saw firsthand how real that risk is with that really hot summer and those raging fires. Recently, across the UK, so many people have witnessed that it was awful floods. We know that the warmer the weather, the wetter it will be. A couple of years ago, I saw absolutely firsthand the true devastation when I went to the eastern part of Ethiopia, a region where just a few years ago it was teeming with wildlife, where you used to say that you should never ask a herder of how far how many, how many animals he has, because you would never be able to stop counting. But right now, that land, totally devastated by consecutive years of drought, millions of people no longer going to be able to live in the lands where they have lived for generations. And the impact of that climate change will mean that more people will be forced to leave their countries, there will be more migration, and that will impact us here at home. Now, we know that unless there's action to tackle emissions, to tackle climate change, we are going to see those impacts accelerating and worsening. And we also know that actions to tackle that climate change need to be global actions. And the government is right that the UK has done more than any other G7 nation to reduce our emissions. They're right that other countries also need to play their part. Incidentally, I get really, really cross when people come and say that to me and they say, in countries like China and India, they're doing nothing. Actually, China is now investing in more renewables than any other country, more than the US and Europe put together. India is on track to deliver 500 gigawatts of renewables by 2030. That is absolutely massive. Countries are moving, and at COP just last month, which I attended, countries all over the world signed up to that pledge to transition away from fossil fuels. We signed that pledge too. Now, the government will quite rightly point out that even with these new oil and gas licences, the North Sea will continue to be a declining basin. We are transitioning away from fossil fuels. But, the perception internationally is that by granting these licences, the UK may be walking away from our promises on climate change. And when encouraging other countries to do the right thing, leadership matters. The UK has a key role to play. 
We hosted the world in Glasgow. We hosted the world at that COP conference. If we, the UK, are seen or perceived to be walking away from the promises that we made to the world, then other countries might walk away from their promises too. And that is why it is absolutely vital that we are seen to be keeping the promises we made. We must continue to cut energy waste and reduce our emissions. Now, I'm very proud to be a member of the Energy Security and Net Zero Select Committee in this House. I think I'm one of only two members of that committee who contribute to this debate. But maybe just I can just say some of the things that we've done and must do more of. Um, millions of homes <laughs> have become more energy efficient. We should continue to do more, especially, I believe, in owner-occupied homes. There's been a huge priority in social rented homes, been very successful, more help for owner-occupiers. We've unlocked just masses amounts of renewable energy. We can unlock more. Uh, it's really important we get it connected to the grid more quickly. The government's working on that. I'd also like to see more local energy networks so that we can have local energy production nearer to where we have high energy risks and then we wouldn't need quite so much extra grid transmission. Um, we need to accelerate new nuclear. Good announcements on that just this month. But especially on the SMRs, can we go faster? We need to remove barriers to more innovations like hydrogen, especially for heat. We need to support the transition to more zero emission vehicles, especially for those in terrace houses, Minister. We do need to get rid of that pavement tax so it's affordable for all. All of these things the government has made great progress on, but we need to do more. And incidentally, Mr Speaker, I will take no lessons from Labour from this, because in their 13 years of power, they did so little to cut well, emissions. Yeah. Um, the government is right that in this transition to the net zero, it needs to be affordable, it needs to be practical, it needs to be pragmatic. Incidentally, it should also be honest with people. Okay, even with these new gas licences, it's estimated that between now and 2050, that will only provide 103 days' worth of gas at today's demand. That's 1%, apparently. So let's have an honest discussion about the fact that this bill won't do everything. However, it is important for energy security um, that we continue to look at how do we best meet our local energy needs. When it comes to offshore oil and gas, um, I've experienced of being first-hand experience about how being a respected world leader on environment issues can be really important in bringing other countries to change their behaviour. Uh, you'll all remember 10 years ago when the world watched in horror when the Deepwater Horizon explosion caused that environmental catastrophe in the Gulf of Mexico. The European Union at the time had a very knee-jerk reaction and produced draft legislation which would have banned all deep water drilling. And as a member of the European Parliament's Energy Committee at the time, I was appointed by MEPs to lead the work of the European Parliament to scrutinise that directive. I met with on offshore safety experts, environmentalists, geologists, regulators, it became very clear that the EU Commission's proposals were not the right for way forward because time and time again I was being told not all deep water drilling is dangerous, not all shallow water drilling is safe. And I remember tabling over 300 amendments to the European Commission's text, literally changing that text paragraph by paragraph so that instead of this um, ban on all deep water, it would take instead a site-specific approach, Mr Speaker, looking at the risks of every single proposal. And I persuaded the British Labour members of the European Parliament that that was the right thing to do. I persuaded the Lib Dems members of the Parliament that was the right thing to do. I persuaded parliamentarians for 27 countries that that was the right thing to do. 
And they agreed because they knew that the UK was the world leader in environmental and safety standards of the offshore oil and gas industry. I'm going to carry on. Uh, my point here is that maintaining our leadership for environmental standards in the North Sea is key to trying to persuade other countries to think about their energy in the future. The government says it wants to continue to be a world leader, but actually right now we've lost a bit of leadership to Norway. Because in Norway, gas is produced in a way that is 50% less carbon intensive than the gas that is produced in our North Sea. So measures such as banning flaring, electrifying the production process through the use of floating wind, working with neighbouring countries to see how you can use our carbon capture capacity in order to decarbonise the refining processes, they could all make a huge difference to the carbon emissions that are caused and used when we are producing oil and gas in our North Sea. And I would like to see the world moving as we transition away from fossil fuels to also consider how do we make that industry as, carbon, uh, as low carbon as possible. I know that colleagues have talked about amendments on, on some of these issues today, and I hope the Minister and the Government will be open to amendments to this bill. I think this bill, as it's worded, doesn't really let the government do anything it can't do already. You can already grant these licences. But it does give the opportunity to really show that this country has an ambition to try and make sure that any carbon emissions that come from fossil fuels during this transition are as low as possible, that our industry is as clear as possible. That would help the UK to maintain its world-leading voice on environmental negotiations to encourage other countries to clean up and decarbonise their production and thus help ensure that the global transition away from fossil fuels is done in as clean a way as possible. And I believe you should be able to do all of that whilst also addressing those other priorities such as delivering on our, and improving our energy security and delivering and improving job security here at home. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The proposed legislation before us is an outrage. I am actually quite pleased that um, this afternoon we had the opportunity to really discuss in detail um, what this means, um, and it was a, a, a relatively good-natured debate. It really, really brings out in detail where the political political choices are. Uh, and the political choices um, of the government benches <coughs> I just find unacceptable. New licenses for new oil and gas fields in the North Sea are in direct conflict with our national and international net zero commitments. We must get away from our dependence on fossil fuel, not <coughs> extend it. And the government has signed an international agreement at COP28 to phase down and phase out fossil fuels, and we are doing the opposite in this country. It is just not acceptable that we do one thing abroad and another thing here at home, and as has been said so many times already this afternoon, it is actually just losing us a reputation for good leadership that we had, and it is losing um, any sort of credibility that the government can have home or abroad. The government's claim that it ensures our energy security is a complete fiction. Recent analysis from the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit finds that oil from new licenses sent to UK refineries would account for less than 1% of fuels used in the UK in 2030. It would make little or no difference to energy security. The Energy Minister herself admits that the legislation would do little to cut bills. Furthermore, on the basis of past records, 
new licenses issued since 2010 have only produced 16 days of extra gas supplies. Between now and 2050, new licenses are only expected to provide four days on average of gas per annum. Four days. Is it really worth it to lose our reputation, our commitments, our path to net zero for that? The vast majority of this new oil and gas production would not stay in the UK. It would be sold on global markets for, for consumption abroad. No government should want a repeat of the energy crisis of last year. It was brought on by the crisis in global fossil fuel supplies and soaring prices on the global oil and gas market. Only by moving away from fossil fuels can it be guaranteed that such a crisis will not be repeated. But this legislation is not just stupid and unnecessary, it is dangerous. It breaks down a decade-long cross-party consensus that every government must be seriously committed to cutting greenhouse gas emissions and provide strong, unflinching leadership to help people, organisations and businesses along the road to a successful energy transition. And we have heard it this afternoon, there is actually quite a lot of consensus. So why breaking down that consensus? It is not, really not understandable. Undermining this consensus is hugely irresponsible. It also sends entirely wrong signals to the international community. The latest COP28 negotiations have shown how rocky the path to net zero is, how important the leadership of developed nations remains. And really, it, it is sad to see, and I was at COP28, um, how this leadership has been lost and how so many um, nations look at us and sh shake their heads and cannot understand what, is going, what has happened to the UK um, in the last year or two. I'm happy to give way. Not just at COP28 and the climate COP where this is an issue. Uh, I was at Montreal, the Nature COP, and we were actually in the vanguard of agreeing that 30% of water should be protected for nature, but these additional drilling rigs cause havoc in our inland waters, and 15% of new licences were actually declared in marine protected areas, and so we're seeing a nature crisis being caused by this, as well as a climate crisis. Well, so, uh, yes, indeed, and many um, of um, organisations to protect um, um, nature and protect the oceans have, have said and have written to me and probably to many members of Parliament of how ex extremely dangerous and damaging it is um, to marine wildlife. The UK is in a strong position geographically to cover its new future energy needs from renewables and from cutting energy consumption, and the Minister knows well my position on this. It is diverse homegrown renewable energy and a significant home insulation programme that are key to this solution. Energy efficiency of our home is amongst the worst in Europe. And yes, if we are talking about jobs, absolutely, in the, in the retrofitting and upgrading sector of our homes, there are so many jobs that we are currently really lacking. We need a new workforce in the new technology and in, in the future of um, our um, UK economy that is a net zero future. That is not looking back at, um, at, at uh, a past fuel that has um, fu um, powered the world, yes, but it does mean that we need to transition and it means that we cannot keep with business as usual. That is the problem and the opportunity and why the government has finished embracing this new future and breaking the consensus that we had across the House is very, very deplorable. So where is the legislation to address um, all of that? Failed project after failed project alongside acute underfunding means that people continue to live in cold homes with sky-high energy bills. So where is legislation to really uh, revolutionise our home retrofitting um, agenda? The problem needs long-term policy and funding commitment rather than the stop and start of this government. While offshore wind is no doubt a success story, we must move faster. Onshore wind development has been slow and so solar is particularly off track. In fact, we are going backwards. The proportion of renewable projects which are being delayed is on the rise. Last year, the government's predictable failure to contract new offshore wind lost five gigawatts of renewable energy and the, the opportunity to save consumers um, two billion pounds a year. Renewable developers still face a planning system that is stuck against onshore wind. Community energy providers still face enormous startup costs. 
Rather than a petroleum bill, why aren't we debating a marine energy bill today to incentivize investment of the various new technologies in marine energy and facilitate the fast rollout of installations? The government is wasting time and money on the fuels of the past. Instead, it should champion UK technology and innovation. So why this bill? My suspicion is that it's an election year bill to drive division and fuel the culture wars. For too long, working people have been made to worry that the green energy transition is a punishment for them and it will cost them prosperity and livelihoods and the way of life that they're used to. But there are countries who have successfully turned the negative narrative into a prospect of hope and major opportunities. The US Inflation Reduction Act and the EU's Green Industrial Plan will together see over $600 billion of green investment creating new and exciting jobs and careers. Even Canada, an economy smaller than ours, announced a package that offers nearly 50 billion pounds worth of tax credits for clean technologies. Green investment will be worth a potential one trillion pounds by 2030. Uncertainty over this government's commitment to reach net zero means that investors are looking the other way. Oil and gas are energy sources of the past. Putting our political future towards them only amplifies how seriously out of touch and out of ideas this current government is. The bill is misleading and counterproductive. It flies in the face of our net zero commitments and will do nothing to ensure our energy security. Indeed, it will do the opposite. We, Liberal Democrats, will support the Labour recent amendment and will oppose this government bill. And I call on all colleagues across the House with an ounce of honesty and integrity to do the same. Mr. Trax. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the, the irony is not lost to me in, in this debate is that every single one of us in this place wants the same thing. And normally, when the whole of the House agrees with something, I think something's wrong. But in this case, I have no doubt that the whole House is right. Uh, we need to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. What we are debating today and arguing both in this place and out is actually how we get there in the most pragmatic way. This bill is another example of the government trying its best to do what is right at this moment in time. But I fear that the punitive taxes, and I want to ask the minister on the front bench about those in a minute in my speech, will not help this investment if indeed, as the government says, it is so needed. To rely more on our own gas and oil from the North Sea is a necessity and full of common sense. It's a fact, and everyone has said in this place, that we'll be relying on fossil fuels for many years to come, decades, a point that no one in this place denies. The UK has made some very impressive advances with wind and solar, Mr Deputy Speaker, and there's a new generation of nuclear on its way. Although I have to say, we have been talking, both the opposition and us, about nuclear investment for years, and so little has been done. Now, wind and solar are excellent ways of generating power. I don't think I've heard anyone here today say yet that when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, it's true. The energy, I'll come to the title in a minute, if I may. The, the, the Honourable has just joined the debate, I think, so... Um, <laughs> but I will answer that. I will, I will raise that point, because Portland, in my constituency, has a huge tidal rate. But it's a fact that when the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow, we don't get the energy we need. So, and we've also cut, as we've heard many times, our emissions by half. We are a world leader and a record to be very proud of. Just touching, if I may, on, uh, as the Honourable Lady has raised the question of tide, yes, of course, if we can explore. We have huge tidal races in this country. Scotland, Portland, as I say, off the coast of South Dorset, to my constituency, if we can harness this and make it work. There are major technical issues, not least with the sand, and the salt water, which is very destructive, and all these things. But if we can get there, absolutely right. It's a, it's a, a way of generating energy that I'm sure everyone would support. I've heard uh, from several 
speakers today uh, about the instability of the world we live in. Now that is very true and I don't have to rehearse why I feel in my lifetime we are facing the most dangerous times in our planet. And if we don't have the power to drive our economy and our homes, I believe would be strategically, quite apart from else, insane. We are an island nation, and I don't have to remind anyone in this house how significant energy independence is going to be in the event of a catastrophe. So here we have a bill that will allow companies to apply for a license to safeguard domestic energy supplies. This, the bill says, will safeguard more than 200,000 jobs, we've heard that already, enhance our security, reduce dependence on higher emission imports from overseas, and significantly prevent families and businesses from being unduly burdened, which to a certain degree they already are through the green taxes that everyone faces. So what's not to like, you may ask. I'm very happy to come here to my honourable friend. Um, I'm very convinced by the argument that my honourable friend is putting forward. Um, he's missed out on one very useful point, is that the generation of oil and gas in the North Sea will generate tax receipts, which can then be used to subsidise green energy production in other parts of the British economy. Do you not agree? Richard Drax. This has been raised several times, I said to my honourable friend, and I totally agree, yes. The tax receipts from this uh, investment from oil and uh, gas are going to play a very large part, do play a, a huge part in our economy. I, I agree. Now, what I'd like to specifically ask the Minister, if I can just grab his ear for one second, um, because I may be, uh, I've got this wrong, but as I understand it, these companies will face a corporation tax of 50% and a windfall levy of 35%. I'd be very grateful if, when he sums up at the end of all this, whether that's true. Now, I'm not an expert in the in, in, in industry, but I would think that chief executives and board members and shareholders will wince if, having been told that we're going to do all this, but we're going to pay all this punitive taxation, they might say, well, why on earth should we do this in the first place? I'd be delighted to give way. Not, not to step on the Minister's toes, but uh, my understanding is even before the energy profits levy, uh, which is an additional 35%, as he pointed out, the oil and gas sector was already the highest tax sector in the country at 40%. So it's 40% plus 35%, 75%, I believe, is the. But I stand to be corrected by the Minister if I'm wrong. Well, I, I, hope, I, I hope you and I, um, my honourable friend, and I can be corrected by the Minister because, as the House has just heard, the tax rates are very punitive. Now, if we're going to do this for all the reasons, common sense reasons, that the Minister and the Government says we should, why on earth are we raising taxes to such a point that it's going to disencourage, disincentivize all those who need to spend hundreds of millions of pounds or more to get this oil and gas out of the ground? Can I just touch also briefly on the, this very powerful Climate Change Committee, which is operates out of this place. We, we hear about it. It's mentioned occasionally. It's pretty unaccountable, frankly, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Very influential. And it's set now a fourth carbon budget, which can be legally challenged once in place. I just wonder whether the government fears it could find itself in the courts as they rightfully plough on with this bill that many who disagree with it, object to. It's shocked me to the core, Mr Deputy Speaker, that it's taken a war in Europe for the West to prioritise both energy and food security. As I said, we're now talking about nuclear power. I mean, how, how many decades have we been talking about this? And what's happened? Very, very little. It's going to be a vital component to keep the lights on and keep this country safe. Globalisation has softened our resolve to stand alone, if need be, when hard times hit, in whatever shape they come. This bill has a lot going for it, not least a most welcome return to our old and absent friend, common sense. Can I urge the government to find pragmatic solutions to the transition to net zero and allow the private sector to do what it does best provide jobs and prosperity, not least, as we've heard, 
in Scotland. The search for alternatives to fossil fuels will continue. And as we've heard, the tax receipts will be used to invest in green energy. And I have no doubt, no doubt at all, that an affordable, reliable and plentiful solution will be found. The human race has a remarkable ability to survive. But in the meantime, can the government continue to work in the real world, keep the lights on, the economy running and the country safe strategically? Matt Weston. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to follow the uh, Honourable Member for uh, South Dorset. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it, the, the irony will not be lost on you, of all people, that today here in Parliament we are reduced in number by the impacts of a storm, Storm Aisha, a storm whose origins lie in climate change. And yet here we are debating the government's desire to increase the global supply of oil and gas. It is also, Mr. Speaker, ironic, actually no damning, that the government's own net zero Tsar, Chris Skidmore, felt compelled to resign, having spent three months researching his report, travelling the length and breadth of these aisles. And of course he said he could no longer condone nor continue to support a government that is committed to a course of action that I know will cause future harm. And perhaps if I could just pick up the point uh, made by the Honourable Member for South Dorset. Ten years ago, um, when I was a councillor in Warwickshire, I was talking about energy resilience and how in Warwickshire we needed to create energy resilience, uh, trying to look at what would be the needs of our future communities and how we could best use our pension funds uh, to help drive that agenda. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, the government claims uh, that this uh, bill will not add undue burdens on households. Undue burdens on households. That's a pretty strange phrase. The Secretary of State also admitted that new licences wouldn't necessarily bring energy bills down. But let's put it into some context. This is the same Conservative government that ripped up the zero carbon homes policy announced by Gordon Brown when he was the Prime Minister in 2000, uh, when he was Chancellor rather, in 2006, and was produced by the Right Honourable Member for Leeds Central and my Right Honourable Friend, the Member for Nenethley. <coughs> that was legislation that would have seen all new homes built from 2016 onwards as zero carbon. Just imagine, that would have been 1.2 million homes today that would have been built that was zero carbon. Thousands of new homes in my constituency of Warwick and Leamington, on the estates of Mallory Grange, the Priors, Montague Point, Mighton Gardens, <laughs> Chesterton Gardens, Victoria Point, and many others, all net zero carbon, net zero carbon homes. And my constituents, who would have been benefiting from next to no energy bills, as well as doing the right thing. But they were denied that choice by the government, the Conservative government, ripping up that legislation. And the next generation will not thank this government for what they have done. They'll not thank them for the debt that we see at one of its highest ever levels, the greatest ever tax burden since the war, the stagnant economy, the moral bankruptcy, dare I say, of this government as well. We have had nine named storms so far, and the tenth one is coming down the track. In 2015-16, we had just 11 named, named storms. <coughs> the flooding is reaching into all corners of the United Kingdom, creating economic damage. The damage to people's homes, to businesses, and the distress to all. The damage to infrastructure, to our crops, to our food production, soil water loss seeds, crops that can't be harvested. And in the insurance world, the report from the EY consultants, last year they said was the worst year for underwriting in decades, pushing up premiums by at least one third in the next two years. That's an expected increase of 36%. And Amanda Blank, this, the chief exec of Aviva, who has said that new oil and gas drilling, and I quote, 
puts at clear risk the jobs growth and the additional investment the UK requires to be more climate ready. So today, we have a country plunged further into chaos, the economic damage, our transport disrupted, the impacts on our businesses, colleagues unable to get here to London to attend Parliament. You know, two weeks ago, I requested a, a debate here in Parliament on floods and flooding. Yet on my return journey home, Mr Deputy Speaker, my train was delayed because of a landslip, because of climate change. Yet more irony. We need a wider debate on the impacts of climate change, not just floods, the tidal surges, the strong winds. The, primate, the Prime Minister speaks of climate zealots. Well, the public, and especially young people, must be climate zealots because I'm afraid they are deeply concerned by this. They are not zealots, they're realists about the future that we face. In my recent visit to primary schools, nearly all the schools I visit, Mr Deputy Speaker, St Margaret's, All Saints, St Paul's, Heathcote, Woodlows, St Peter's, Coton End, Bishop's Tatchbrook, they, I could name them all. They all raise with me how critically important they view climate change and how they want us in this place to bring about immediate action. But you know, it's also young people who are studying in our colleges. They understand the future. They can see what it is. They realise, and as they quoted to me, they said to me, the future is electric. That's why we're training for these skills. They get it, Mr Deputy Speaker. They can see the future. We know now that 2023 was the world's hottest on record. Last year was about one point for eight degrees centigrade warmer than the long-term average before humans started burning large amounts of fossil fuel, fuel, fuels. Indeed, the eight warmest years on record have occurred since 2014. Global average sea level has risen eight to nine inches. Flooding across the UK, including in Warwick and Leamington, my constituency, uh, has damaged a total of 2,000 properties across the country. 5.7 million properties were at risk of flooding uh, in England in 22 and 23. These are facts, Mr Deputy Speaker, that underline just how irresponsible this bill is. 18 years on from the Stern report and the inconvenient truth told like never before by Vice President Al Gore, two years ago the report by the UK's Independent Climate Change Committee said that the best way to ease consumers' pain from high energy prices was to stop using fossil fuels rather than drill for more of them. And that is part of the great deception that is this legislation. The best way to bring down prices is to reduce demand. Here the government is doing next to nothing. And we need to bring in cheaper energy sources. Reduce demand by insulating homes, as I said, putting ener energy insulation panels in, which are just that thick, is an obscenity. It is a crime. I believe, in the current legislation, and because the government tore up the legislation of the last Labour government. But we need to bring in cheaper energy sources by allowing onshore wind, currently the cheapest form of electricity generation. Mr Deputy Speaker, when you consider that in the 12 months to the end of September 2023, the total consumer expenditure on electricity, gas and other fuels used on the home was £62 billion, a figure almost double what it was two years before. And as my right honourable friend, the member for Doncaster North said, it is precisely our dependence on fossil fuels that has led to the worst cost of living crisis in a generation. And it was clear from the King's speech that this legislation won't even take a penny off energy bills. Lord Brown, of all people, the former chief exec of British Petroleum, a highly regarded individual across the industry and in the place next door, a cross-bench peer who said this is not going to make any difference to the UK's energy security, a point that was echoed also by the former Prime Minister and Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead. Yeah. So inclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, the energy security has to start at home, not the home of the international oil and gas majors and their market preferences, but the homes of the British people. Homes that are better insulated, homes 
that can generate their own electricity, homes that can store their own electricity and power. The only thing holding back the British people is this government, a government that is weak and only capable of short-term decisions. And that, Mr Deputy Speaker, is why the country needs Labour's clean power mission, to make the UK a clean energy superpower, a plan to make energy cheap and secure so that the British public never again face spiralling bills, to boost jobs and investment in every region and nation of the country, cut energy bills for good, taking up to £1,400 of annual household bills, create good jobs by rebuilding the strength of our industrial heartlands and coastal communities, creating over a million jobs in 10 years, and deliver energy security using our abundant natural resources for our own citizens. And we'll do this by establishing GB Energy, a new homegrown, publicly owned champion in clean energy generation to build jobs and supply chains here at home, and to set up the National Wealth Fund, which will create good, well-paying jobs by investing alongside the private sector in gigafactories, clean steel plants, and renewable-ready ports, green hydrogen and energy storage, and through a warm homes plan. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's yet another reason why this country is desperate for a general election, and I will be voting against. Sandy Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I first of all welcome um, the fact that the government has introduced this bill, even though it may well be a belated acceptance that some of the policies which they had been following in pursuit of net zero uh, have to be revised. And of course, we know that uh, because of the energy security issues which arose as the, and the, the, the cost of energy uh, rising so dramatically in response to the fall in supply as a result of the war in Ukraine and the, um, the sanctions imp imposed on Russia, as well as the supply chain impact that there was after COVID, that the supply of energy and especially oil and gas to an economy which still depends very heavily on uh, those kinds of uh, sources of energy is very important. And let's not pretend that somehow or other we are on the verge of not having to use oil and gas any longer. 75% of our energy comes from oil and gas. 5% comes from renewables. Even those who want us to rush headlong towards net zero, like the Climate Change Committee, except that we are still going to have to use fossil fuels well into um, the next decade and indeed for decades ahead of that. And therefore, it is important that we examine how we generate those resources. I think it's also an, exception, an acceptance, or there should be an acceptance by the government now, that as we have pursued the net zero agenda, we are putting people's jobs at risk. We have seen it just this in the last week: three thousand jobs in South Wales. We have had the most of the energy-intensive in, uh, industries in this country decimated. And we proudly beat our chests and say we have reduced our carbon emissions. And all we have done, if we are honest with ourselves, is steal jobs from this country and move production for vital materials overseas to a place where environmental standards and work standards and uh, uh, the, the standards of pollution are far, far less than what exists in this country. And therefore, I, I welcome the fact that the government is uh, belatedly looking again at some of the policies which um, it was pursuing. In relation to uh, this particular bill, I do not know, quite frankly, whether this will increase the number of licence applications which are made. It may well be that, since the process is already there, it will just, e just be as easy now as it was in the past for companies to make an application. But what I do think is that at least it signals to those companies that 
have, quite frankly, reduced their investment in these vital industries. It signals to them that, look, you can, um, at least with this policy, have some more confidence when you make investment decisions. Though I doubt very much, given the attitude of the, the opposition party and the fact that we are in a year of a general election, um, that maybe that confidence will be engendered as much as what the government hopes it will be. But we have, and I don't want to go through all of the arguments that have been made, um, whether it's on the balance of payments. Don't forget, as a result of the natural decline in the North Sea and the fact that we also have discouraged investment, since 2019 until 2023, we have doubled the value of imports per household of energy into the United Kingdom from £2,100 per household in 2019 to £4,200 in 2023. And we cannot ignore the impact that that has on the balance of payments or indeed the security of supply, because those imports are coming from um, countries which are sometimes less stable than um, we, we need them to be for, um, for, for uh, energy and such a vital resource. And it's one of the reasons why, when I read the Labour Amendment, that this policy will ensure the UK remains at the mercy of petrostates and dictators who control fossil fuels. I wonder, where's the logic of it? Because, see, if we don't get it from the North Sea, we get it from Saudi Arabia, Russia, Venezuela, and many other countries which use oil as a political weapon and who are not always well disposed towards us. So, in actual fact, by diminishing our dependence on oil and gas, which we can extract from our own territory, we put ourselves at the mercy of those who can politicise uh, one of our energy resources. The second reason, and, uh, and I, I think that, that, that we, we've got to be cognizant of that, the second reason, is, of course, is that we do have 200,000 jobs across the United Kingdom. And strangely enough, 90,000 jobs in Scotland, where the SNP appear to be quite happy to sacrifice those jobs. Now, are we going to sacrifice? We've sacrificed jobs in many energy-intensive industries already. Are we now saying that we're going to sacrifice these jobs, very often well-paid jobs, um, and say that there'll be a just transition? I've heard that argument made in this House so many times. Oh, all these people who are employed in the oil and gas industry will go into renewables. Well, let's look where, where the government tells us that we have had the, a huge increase in renewable production. Has it resulted in jobs for United Kingdom workers? Yes. No, of yes. course it hasn't. <laughs> where, 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 where are the windmills made? Where's the steel for the windmills made? Not in Port Talbot, and not for very long either. Uh, even the, the steel that's still made there is, will bring it halfway around the world from countries which make it cheaply. And they make it cheaply because they use the cheapest form of energy to make it. And so this idea that suddenly we're going to have all these people employed in the manufacture and the installation of solar panels and, and, and windmills, we would have people um, maintaining them, we'd have EV battery factories all over the place. It hasn't happened. And graduates employed in finance and everything else for the, the, the offshore industry, uh, it, it just hasn't happened. So this just transition will, is not going to occur. And why, do you, why would we transition when there is still a resource to be exploited by the people who have the skills to do that and for the benefit of the, 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 the country? The third argument which has been made um, here um, that I wish to make in favour of this uh, bill is the necessity. We've, I mean, 
84% of our heating is currently done by gas. Home heating, domestic heating, 5% from oil. 97% of our travel is driven by fossil fuels. 40% of our electricity is generated from um, fossil fuels. And that is going to continue into the future. And quite frankly, Mr Deputy Speaker, I doubt very much if some of the arguments we have heard made here tonight, that, oh, we must be a global leader in, the, in this field of uh, get, uh, 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 getting to net zero. I doubt very much if that rings true with the ordinary people who want to see their houses heated efficiently and cheaply and, and securely, who want to be able to drive their cars and get on the, into their, the buses or get on the trains or the planes or whatever way that they decide to travel, or who want to ensure that the electricity supply comes. And anyway, we might, we might fool ourselves we are global leaders. The truth of the matter is we produce 1% of global emissions. Other countries that quite rightly want to industrialise do not heed us. They're, go, they're, they're going for the cheapest form of energy, for the energy which is available to them. And, you know, I think it's a bit arrogant of people in this House to say to countries in Africa, for example, where in some places 85% of people are not even collect, connected to an electricity grid, where they don't have the benefit that we have of going in and turning a light on at night or having a fridge where they can keep their food fresh and keep it from deteriorating in the heat. It's a bit arrogant of us to say, and by the way, you might have plenty of coal, and you might have plenty of oil, but we don't want you to use it. We don't want you to have the benefits of the cheap energy that give us our prosperity. Cheap energy is the, for, is the, 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 the ground of, of economic growth, and I can, I can understand why people don't follow our lead and why they do their own thing. And this idea that somehow or other, because we pass this bill tonight, the whole world is going to say, oh, this is terrible. Britain is no longer committed to net zero, and we are now going to do our own thing. They're doing their own thing anyway. And I think for many people in the United Kingdom, the, 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 the question that they have is, what is my government doing to maintain my standard of living? And the, the, this idea of global leadership is not at the, f the forefront of their, their thinking. The, I have some reservations, I've got to say, about this. And the first reservation I have is that if this is designed to engender confidence, and the member for um, Dorset uh, made this point as well, if this is designed to engender confidence, I think that many companies looking at whether or not they apply for licences will be asking themselves, does, even with this legislation, does that guarantee that if we put money into licences and applying for licences and exploring for oil, that we are going to, not going to find our way blocked and our opportunities, our uh, uh, economic opportunities, um, blocked by judicial reviews by people who will simply say, the UK has a target for global emissions. Part of the target for global emissions uh, was going to be met by reducing oil production uh, in our own um, country. And as a result of this bill and as a result of granting licences, you're going to miss those targets and we're going to judicially review it. If there is likely to be a judicial review, and if there is a, a path open for a judicial review, and a basis on which to make a judicial review, I doubt very much whether it will engender the confidence that the Minister is hoping it will engender. The second thing is that if we are going to, and people have made this argument here tonight, if we are going to exploit the oil that we have and benefit from it, then better to keep it in our own country and make sure it's, it's, it's used in our own country. Now, 80, 88% of the gas that we extract, extract is actually used in the UK. Why? Because we've got the network for it to feed into and therefore it can be used and sold in the UK. We don't, and the, the member for, um, um, I can't remember his constituency, but uh, raised the issue of, of, of Greensmouth. 
And Grangemouth is not the only example. We, we, haven't, we don't invest in the facilities for refining oil in the United Kingdom. And why do we not? Because, once again, oil refining is an oil-intensive industry. And given all of the carbon taxes and the, the barriers which put, are put in the way of carbon-intensive industries, no investment is taking place. No investment is taking place in, in, in uh, oil refinery for decades now. So what do we do? We extract it and we send it elsewhere. Now we bring it back, most often. But would it not be of benefit to, to ensure that it stays in the United Kingdom because we actually have the facilities for processing it in um, the United Kingdom? Yeah. And the last reservation that I would raise um, uh, tonight is that when we have the kind of determination from what might be the next government in the United Kingdom to undo all of this, then will that give and engender the confidence that uh, people have? I mean, there, there's a, a huge... I know that probably I am in a minority when it comes to this debate. But there is a debate to be had in this House between the ideologues who are driving a policy a policy which most people in this House can well afford. I mean, if the cost of energy goes up as a result of renewables, and, and people may, may say, oh, that's not true. Well, actually, listen to what the, um, the, the, the chief executive of Siemens, who are the biggest wind um, producers uh, of electricity in the uh, United Kingdom, uh, said just this week, higher bills are inevitable as we grapple with the huge costs um, of uh, generating wind power because of inflation, because of the costs of maintenance, false and breakdowns. And he made, this is the point he made, transition comes at a cost. It is painful and governments don't just want to hear it. And, un and unfortunately, um, I think that, that this is the battle we have between people in this House who are wedded to an ideology and will drive it through, and will drive it through regardless of the impact it has on our constituents. How many crocodile tears have I seen cried in this House when people lose their jobs in energy intensive industries and then in the next breath saying the government's not going hard enough to reach net zero? So there's a, a divide between those who are driven by this ideology and the ordinary people in the country who live with the consequences of it. And I'm glad to see if this bill is at least a start to trying to redress that imbalance, then I'm, I welcome it. Uh, Nadia Whitton. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Just last month, COP28 made history by acknowledging for the first time the need to transition away from fossil fuels. It shouldn't have taken 28 COPs to accept what scientists have known for decades. But despite all the vested interests at play, the efforts of hundreds of lobbyists, the huge sums poured into preventing climate action, the truth became impossible to ignore. The effects of climate chaos are now in plain sight. The ten hottest years on record, as mentioned previously in this debate, all happened in the last decade. And the speed of change is only increasing. To avert catastrophe, we must work now towards a fossil-free future. So why does our government keep insisting on keeping us in the past and trying to build our recovery on a resource that the world has formally committed to moving away from? The government claims that it's about lowering household bills. Well, even the Energy Secretary admitted that it won't because the energy generated from new oil and gas would not belong to the British people, powering our homes for cheap. It would be in the hands of private companies and sold on the global markets for internationally set prices. It would be owned by those same energy companies that have already made record-breaking profits in the cost of living crisis, while 13 million households sat in the cold last winter too scared to turn on the heating. Madam De Deputy Speaker, those corporations don't need any more state handouts. If the government really cared about energy bills, 
It would be funding a mass programme of insulating homes, which the Tories slashed support for in 2013. If it cared about securing our future, it would be focusing on investing in publicly owned homegrown renewables, which have never been cheaper. It would be delivering a Green New Deal to protect our living standards and our planet for decades to come. So if not to lower our bills now, if not to ensure energy security in the future, if not to enable a green transition, why is the government pushing this dangerous and unpopular bill? Is it just to annoy environmentalists and turn climate policies into a wedge issue? Or could it have anything to do with the fact that the Conservatives have taken £3.5 million in a year from big polluters, climate deniers and fossil fuel interests? Madam Deputy Speaker, when justifying this act of climate vandalism, the government likes to reference the Climate Change Committee, but unfortunately it's misrepresented the advice of that committee to the point that its chair, Piers Forster, has been forced to speak out. He said, as, as a response to the government's false claims, and I quote, UK oil and gas consumption needs to fall by over 80% to meet UK targets. This and the COP decision makes further licensing inconsistent with climate goals. This is not only embarrassing, it's deeply concerning that on an issue as important as the future of our planet, the government is either unable or unwilling to understand expert advice. And it's not just the Climate Change Committee that has warned against new fossil fuels. So has the UN Secretary General. He called, and members opposite would do well to listen to this, he called on all nations to cease all licensing or funding of new oil and gas. So has the International Institute for Sustainable Development, which said no new oil and gas development is possible if the world is to stay within the Paris Agreement temperature limits. So has the International Energy Agency, whose director said if governments are serious about the climate crisis, there can be no new investments in oil, gas and coal. And so have over 700 scientists who wrote to the PM last year, asking him to halt the licensing. Yeah. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, should we be taking advice from hundreds of leading climate experts or from lobbyists for fossil fuel industries? The bill in front of us won't solve any of our problems. It will just contribute to wrecking the planet and undermine our climate credibility on the international stage. So, for the sake of our futures and our planet, I urge the House to vote down this dangerous bill. Caroline Lewis. Yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Nottingham East. I have to say slightly less of a pleasure to have listened to the Honourable Member for East Antrim, and I just do want to say a few words about uh, the case that he made, because it really does, I think, um, reach new depths to suggest somehow that the poorest people in this country are somehow going to be better off if we continue exploiting more exactly. oil and gas, when we know very, very clearly that it is new oil and gas and existing oil and gas that is so expensive. And he cited the example of Siemens talking about the expensiveness of renewables, but that's precisely because they are linked to the price of gas. Yeah, and yeah. that is why we need to reform yeah. the totally out of date electricity and yeah, gas yeah. system that we have yeah, yeah. in this country today. And I think it tells us all we need to know about this cynical and failing government, that the first legislation that it was going to debate in this House in 2024 was a bill to mandate the annual licensing of oil and gas projects in the North Sea. Not legislation that rises to the immediate challenges that we face as a society, from the cost of living scandal, which sees families unable to meet their basic needs, to the planetary emergency rapidly unfolding before yeah. our eyes, but instead a bill that is frankly no more than a political stunt at home, yet at the same time a very dangerous signal to other countries abroad of a UK doubling down on the fossil fuel economy. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, as many have said tonight, that this bill is entirely redundant, with yeah. even the North Sea Transition Authority expressing their, in quotes, unanimous view that it is not needed. Because as the minister knows perfectly well, 
there have been annual licensing rounds for most of the past decade, driven by the frankly obscene duty to maximise the economic recovery of UK petroleum. And yet, despite the hundreds of licences which have been issued in that time, a paltry 16 days' worth of gas has actually been produced. And as others have also said, looking forward between now and 2050, it's been estimated that new licences will provide the equivalent of just four days' worth of gas each year. So it is hardly the energy security that we've been promised and that we've heard so much about from the benches opposite over the last three or four hours. And of course, any oil and gas which is extracted will be owned by companies and sold on the international market to the highest bidder. Unless, of course, yep. the government, unbeknownst to us, actually has in mind the renationalisation of energy, which would be a very interesting conversation to have. But when I last checked, that wasn't their policy. This oil and gas in the North Sea does not belong to the government, and it will not bring down bills. And let's not forget either that 80% of UK oil is currently exported, as was the equivalent of more than 60% of gross gas production yeah. last year. Will the Honourable Member give way? I will. Uh, I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for giving way. Uh, one such example is Gazprom International UK, which continued to produce gas from the North Sea last year. This subsidiary company of Gazprom paid a £1.7 million, dividend, sorry, 1 .7 million Euro dividend in June 2023. Does she think it's hypocritical for this Conservative government to talk about this bill in terms of national security while simultaneously allowing a Russian energy giant to extract gas from the North Sea and pay taxes in Moscow? Well, I thank him for, his, uh, for the point that he makes, and I think it is incredibly well made, and I'll say a little bit more myself on that subject very shortly. But essentially, this bill is nothing more than reckless political theatre. It is nothing more than a cynical attempt to stoke yet more division and weaponise much-needed climate action in some misguided sense that somehow this is going to save the Prime Minister's own skin. And yet, whilst this bill serves to highlight the impotence of this government at home, sadly, its international impact is far-reaching. Because the, despite the Prime Minister's fairly evidence-free claim at COP28 that the UK is leading by example, the reality is that creating a climate culture war, scrapping vital policies and issuing new fossil fuel licences are the very opposite of climate leadership. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This bill sends a dangerous signal and it yeah. undermines global efforts to address the climate emergency by hampering diplomacy and legitimising extraction in other countries. As Lord Deben, former chair of the Climate Change Committee, has said, how can we ask other nations not to expand fossil fuel production if we are doing it ourselves? And I think it is, frankly, a scandal that the UK is amongst just five countries in the global north that are responsible for more than half of the planned expansion of new oil and gas fields up to 2050. And whilst ministers like to claim that even with continuing licensing, production from the UK continental shelf is projected to decline at 7% annually, what matters is not whether we're producing less relative to some previous time, but whether the oil and gas we are producing now is compatible with our climate goals. And quite clearly it is not, with the UN production gap report warning that governments already plan to produce far more than double the amount of fossil fuels in 2030 than would be consistent with limiting heating to 1.5 degrees. The government's defence of this bill and the continuing licensing of more oil and gas in the North Sea as a whole somehow implies that the UK operates in a kind of a vacuum and that domestic decisions have no bearing on our ability to meet our international climate targets. That, very clearly, is not the case. And it's no surprise, then, that Professor Piers Forster, the interim chair of the Climate Change Committee, has said, and I quote, UK oil and gas consumption needs to fall by over 80% to meet UK targets. This and the recent COP decision make further licensing inconsistent with our climate goals. And when we're talking about inconsistency with our climate goals, maybe we could also talk about hypocrisy. Because since a climate emergency was declared in this very chamber in 2019, no fewer than 17 new fields have been approved. La Verda, Barnacle, Cadet, Silimanet, Blythe, Elgood, Southwark, Evelyn, Abigail, Jackdaw, Tom Lighton, Tolbert, Teal West, Murlock, Alwyn East, Rosebank, and most recently of all, Victory. But while I mention Rosebank, it gives me an opportunity to come back to the issue that has been touched on a few times in the debate tonight 
around the scale of fossil fuel subsidies. Because we've heard a whole load of guff on the other side about how important the revenues are from the taxes that come from oil and gas. And yet, when we actually look at the amount of money we are giving to the oil and gas industry, and the honourable member uh, next to me, uh, the Liberal Democrat from a constituency I don't remember, but when he was making the point about uh, tax revenues going to Russia, we could also point out what's going to happen with Rosebank. Because with the Rosebank field, which will be developed by Equinor, the UK taxpayer is going to hand over no less than £3.75 billion pounds equivalent to Equinor to be able to develop that site. And that is because of the massive loophole in the windfall tax, which means that for every £100 invested, £91.40 can be claimed back. So I, I do think a little bit of uh, clarity on these issues would help. And on that subject, too, I do have a question for the Secretary of State when she comes to give him uh, the summing up at the end. Section 20 uh, requires that a statement is made on the front of this bill to say whether or not it's in line with uh, other environmental laws. And, and the Secretary of State claims in her Section 20 statement on the front of this bill that, and I quote, it won't have the effect of reducing the level of environmental protection provided for by any existing environmental law. And to me, that seems a bit of an extraordinary statement to make, because even if one believed that the carbon intensity test would make a difference, the annual licensing rounds under the bill could easily cancel out any predicted carbon savings and lead to an overall increase in emissions. So I do hope that she will tell us when she sums up what modelling was undertaken to inform her Section 20 statement. Looking at the content of the bill a little more closely, it proposes two so-called tests which are set so ludicrously low that they are impossible to fail. First, the carbon intensity test, which is met if the carbon intensity of domestically produced gas is lower than that of imported liquefied natural gas. A test which not only ignores the fact that more than half of our gas imports come from Norway via pipeline, as we've established, where gas production is half as polluting as in the UK, but also, in only considering gas, it fails to take account of the fact that 70% of remaining North Sea oil reserves are oil. And in any case, comparing the carbon intensity at the point of production rather than combustion exaggerates the difference between different sources, given the vast majority of emissions are actually produced when any oil and gas is burned. In other words, there's scope three emissions, which remain entirely unaccounted for. And second, the net importer test, which would be met if the amount of oil and gas produced in the UK is less than the UK's demand for oil and gas. Well, surely that question would be much better addressed by reducing demand rather than by producing more planet-heating oil and gas. And yet that issue of demand reduction is one that this government seems incapable of pursuing in any meaningful yeah. way at all. Yeah. So what should the government be doing instead? Well, if they were actually interested in cutting household bills and delivering energy security, then they will be working to get us off expensive gas for good rather than continuing to tether us to volatile international markets. The National Infrastructure Commission has been really clear that, and I quote, reliance on fossil fuels means exposure to geopolitical shocks that impact the prices of these internationally traded commodities. And in their 2022 Energy Outlook report, the IEA reported that a higher share of renewables correlated with lower electricity prices in response to the energy crisis, with energy efficiency and heat electrification providing an important buffer for households. And so at a time when we've heard six million families in the UK are living in fuel poverty this winter, we have to ask why is the government doubling down on the very thing at the heart of this crisis? when instead what they should be doing is delivering that meaningful just transition which genuinely meets the needs yep. of workers and communities rather than temporarily mm. propping up insecure jobs that we know will not exist in years to come. And again, the kind of rhetoric on the other side of the house pretending that those of us who are wanting to accelerate a transition to a greener economy are somehow not the ones that also have people's jobs in mind is just totally untrue. It is precisely yeah, yeah. because we care about people's jobs that we want them to have sustainable jobs yeah, into yeah. the future, good quality, decent yeah. jobs in the future, instead of pretending that somehow these draining resources in the North Sea are going to provide that sustainable livelihood in years to come. Yeah. There needs to be a massive scaling up of renewables rather than continuing to yeah. back cheap and abundant uh, energy sources like, sorry, there should be a massive scaling up of renewables 
um, and, and to back cheap and abundant energy sources like onshore wind, for which a grand total of zero applications have been submitted since planning rules were changed in September. There should be a nationwide, street-by-street -street energy efficiency programme to ensure families have worn homes for the long term, rather than scrapping the upgrade in standards in private rented homes, which, according to the Climate Change Committee, could have saved tenants £250 a year, even at so-called normal prices, let alone at a time when prices are spiralling. And again, what an indictment of this government. Remember the Green Deal back in, when was it, 2012 or something? They set the interest rates so ridiculously high, as we all said at the time, that not surprisingly, the whole plan collapsed yeah. and those homes were not insulated and plenty of energy companies, including some in my own yeah. constituency, went bust as a result. They are incompetent yeah. as well as yeah, totally yeah, yeah. ideologically yeah, yeah. driven. Yeah, yeah. They should be properly taxing the filthy profits of oil and gas companies rather than foisting the cost of new developments onto the taxpayer. And they should urgently withdraw from the dangerous energy charter treaty, yeah, yeah. which, it beggars yeah. belief, allows us to be sued by fossil fuel companies. A fairer and greener energy system is entirely possible, but it requires both imagination and investment, two qualities which I do not associate with this government. <laughs> this legislation makes it painfully clear that the government are willfully ignoring the lessons of both the climate and the energy crises, and are once again privileging their own interests above the well-being of people and planet. This bill sends exactly the wrong signal at the wrong time and actively undermines global efforts to address the climate emergency by hampering that diplomacy and giving the green light to further extraction right ar around the world. It's not what leadership looks like, it's not what this moment demands, and our constituents, all of them, deserve better. Yeah. Yeah. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it is a pleasure to follow the Honourable Lady for Brighton Pavilion. Um, while we don't always agree on everything, there's many things that we do agree on, uh, and I do agree very much with the Honourable Lady uh, uh, the mass scale up of renewables. I, I think that's what I would like to see. Uh, it's certainly the, the, the focus that I want to put on, but I also want to be, if I can be, pragmatic about where we are uh, and some of the things that we need to do, and at the same time, what this bill does tonight as well. The issue of energy is one that impacts every person in this UK. From the one bed flat owner to the 200 bed hotel owner, the ability to secure safe and reliable energy is an essential, and the sperling costs are really having an effect on the day to day life of people throughout the UK. I want to, I want to make this point because I think it's really important that I make this point and then I explain perhaps where I am personally on, on this matter. Um, I, I, I grew up in an age, and some others in the house are probably the same. Uh, of an age of, of throwing another jumper on, and my children used to laugh at the stories that I used to tell them of how cold they had to be before the heating was turned on. For us today, it's no longer a laughing matter. Uh, for many, many people, my researcher who owns a modest sized home had to put over £250 of gas into her home in December. She was home for a, for a term time. The children were home, and she tells me that this wasn't even running constantly. It was turned off whenever she was going to visit her, her parents or her husband's parents or, or going out when she told me that. So I thought, how much more. Would a, a we I use that word often in the house. It's, it's a, uh, uh, a descriptive personality uh, uh, pronunciation that I have. The wee widow pensioner be paying in their home when they're there almost all day, every day. The figure is not one that their pension and a single fuel, winter fuel payment can cover. There are only so many jumpers you can put on, and a jumper doesn't cover a damp wall. It is clear that the cost of energy dictates what steps we take to secure current energy supplies, while also striving for new alternative renewable sources of energy. And as many of you in this place will have heard me say on numerous occasions, tidal energy in Stratford Lock and other such areas need a great deal of funding. The pilot scheme was one that worked, but it was at the wrong time, because the cost of the energy that it produced was not just feasible or financial feasible, but it would be now. And if we can harness that power, which is as reliable as the sun rising in the morning, then we are, I believe, on a winner. However, I do understand that this is not the point of today's bit, and we will leave it at that. The ministers, well, the Secretary of State, Senator Pace, tonight, and I know that the uh, government has taken giant steps to, uh, met the, to meet the net zero target, targets to uh, commit themselves to green energy. And I wish to put on target I am committed to the same uh, targets as well, to the meeting the net zero targets, to making sure that the green energy opportunities are there. But we do, I believe, uh, need a balance, and the balance I put forward to the House tonight uh, for, from the point of view, and I wish to, I'm a, I make a, uh, a declaration, Madam Deputy Speaker, as a farmer, 
we own land. My neighbours are all dairymen uh, and, and uh, um, beef, cattle and sheep. Uh, the, the, the net zero targets are ones that the, my farmers and my neighbours are willing to commit themselves to because they see that the net zero is something that must be done as well. But part of that net zero target, target for, for farmers is that they must reduce their, their, their animals. And that's not really possible to, to continue to have a feasible and financially viable farm. So there's other things that the farmers wish to do. In the countryside where I live, uh, the fact of the matter is there isn't enough EV points. So when it comes to buying a, a, an a, a electric car or a hybrid car, you probably don't do that where I live because EV points are all up in Newton hours. So I drive a, a diesel vehicle, have done all my days, and probably if I'm spared, Madam Deputy Speaker will continue to do so because I believe that's a choice. It's a choice we don't maybe wish to maybe do every time, but a choice that we have to because the, the feasibilities of, of, of electric cars and EV points are just not there. My honourable friend, I'm very happy to go. Yes, absolutely. Do you agree with me that the, the National Farmers Union have been very positive on many of these issues? And wouldn't you agree with what they say is that hydrogen is going to be the source of sustainable power and the sustainable energy in the future, and it's coming soon? I, I think my, my, I, I call my honourable friend with a great respect for the honourable. I write on with gentleman for Huddersfield, and I, and I agree wholeheartedly with what he's just said there. I, th I think the farming community and the NFU and the Ulster Farmers Union in Northern Ireland are, are clearly committed to, to targets, and they are committed to looking at alternatives, but the alternatives have to be practical. And the point I'm trying to make is where we are practical, practically tonight. There's no doubt that in order to meet our net zero target, but more importantly, our environmental obligations, we need to do a better job at, at, at assessing and using renewable energy fields. However, the fact is that we are simply not going to be there any time soon. And in the meantime, it is vital that we secure the safety and the security for uh, our constituents. I support the aims of the bill, which enhance procedures which are currently in place. And note that there should be no financial hardship passed on through this bill. And this is vital as I know households are struggling with current pressure. No longer is it a matter for simply households in poverty, working families with decent wages. Um, so, so it's a transition. It's increasing our net zero targets is increasing our green energy uh, and renewables, which the Honourable Lady, Lady for Brighton uh, and, and Hove Admin referred to. So we're doing those things at the same time. This, I believe, this bill gives the opportunity uh, to, to progress uh, those renewables in a way that can be positive in the short term. The library briefing makes clear that currently li licensing rounds are, are run with the NST8 and decides that it's necessary. Uh, however, that should be highlighted is that these have been held on a broadly annual basis up to the 32nd licensing round that opened in 2019. Uh, the latest 33rd licensing round was launched in October 22, following the introduction of a climate compatibility checkpoint in September 2022. In October 2023, 27 new licenses were awarded as part of this licensing round. This is not onerous, but it is necessary to not simply safeguard our industry by enhancing investor and industry confidence, as the government has highlighted, is also to do so in a way which is not seeing families scraping together pennies to afford heat. So my, the, my contribution to this debate, Madam Deputy Speaker, is clearly for those people who are in energy difficulties. And, and today, and, and, and the papers that referred to the food bank uh, referrals, which have gone up some 30 per cent, the one in my constituency of Strangford and my major town of Newton Ards, uh, they saw just over uh, December and, and early January a 30 per cent increase in, in, in food banks by people who are middle class who are finding it difficult to make the energy uh, prices uh, that, are, that are presently uh, um, they have to deal with. I know several young families who um, also uh, are usually enjoy a few days away when the kids are off at Christmas, and they told me that, that they just weren't able to do it this year. Now you're going to say, for goodness sake, well, if they can't go on holiday, that's only, but I'm not saying this because it is their right to have this break, but I'm highlighting that the knock-on effect for families of increased prices means they can't afford to sow into the local economy the way they used to. So the little 20 bed uh, hotel that they usually visit don't get their business. Knock-on effect is that they don't hire the cleaner for as many hours and whose income drops, she, and she can't spend the way she usually does. So knock-on continues. We need the people who spend locally to do so, and for them to do that, bills, energy bills need to be manageable, and we are currently failing when it comes to energy provision. If this bill helps to safeguard our provision, as we still continue to find better ways to source renewable, reliable energy, 
then I am in support of that. And when the Minister or the Secretary of State, whoever's summing up, can, can give us that reassurance, I'd be a whole lot happier uh, in relation to this debate. Of course, we need to explore tidal energy, but safeguarding domestic production can go hand in hand with that. And indeed, we must do so. So I'm committed to the renewables. I'm committed to green energy possibilities. I'm committed to net zero targets. Because uh, the neighbourhood that I live, the farming community that I live in, they want to commit themselves to that as well. So I support our families, our vulnerable, ill, and elderly, and those who are living in cold, damp homes because they cannot afford to do so otherwise. And therefore, at this stage, with with the provision that I am supporting the bill this evening on behalf of all those who are struggling to heat their homes and keep their families warm, commit ourselves to more renewables. Make sure that the renewables. Uh, percentage rises, and if it rises, then we can reduce, I believe, the gas uh, uh, and, and petroleum um, usage. And by doing so, we can balance the, the process. That's what I'm hoping for out of the minister's reply tonight. I hope we can deliver on that. Thank you. Uh, before I call the shadow minister, I do want to emphasise again, and I will do when he's finished, um, how important it is for those who have contributed to the debate to be here for the wind-ups. Shadow Minister, Dr Alan White. Yeah. 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 Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have had an excellent uh, and a very pointed uh, debate this evening. Uh, and certainly from, uh, from our side, uh, honourable members combining together to point out the deficiencies in this bill, point out what a specious and potentially damaging bill it is, uh, and uh, indeed... Uh, questioning uh, why this bill was brought to this House in the first place, which is very much what I uh, want to do. The, my honourable uh, friend, member for Rotherham, uh, called this bill Ill illogical and damaging and pointed out that uh, marine protection areas could be put at risk by the bill. The, my honourable friend, the honourable member for Lernethley, um, pointed out that this makes us look ridiculous uh, on a world stage. Uh, my honourable friend, the member for uh, Brent North uh, pointed out the bill itself was based on a series of lies and indeed uh, quoted uh, the UN General Secretary uh, stating that the truly dangerous radicals are those countries that are increasing their output uh, of oil uh, and gas. The, uh, my honourable friend, the member for Coventry South, uh, did point out strongly that this, this uh, uh, bill, contrary uh, to its claims, is not about energy security. Uh, my hon honourable friend, member for Warwick and Leamington, uh, reminded us of the real effects of climate change right now, uh, pointed out that the future is largely electric and this bill uh, is a great deception. Uh, the honourable member for Bath called the bill stupid, unnecessary and dangerous. Uh, didn't rinse her words very much. Um, honourable uh, honourable uh, friend, uh, the, the member for uh, Nottingham East, uh, laid, I think, many of the myths of this bill uh, to rest. Uh, and uh, indeed questioned why the government is pushing this bill in the first place. And the uh, honourable member for uh, Brighton Pavilion uh, pointed out uh, the political theatre uh, that is behind this bill and uh, why it is completely incompatible uh, with our climate change uh, commitments. Because uh, this really is a reprehensible bill. Uh, it's a bill that's based on uh, a number of myths and, uh, 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 and, and lies, frankly, uh, and that, that requires people uh, to believe that there are people around really saying that uh, uh, oil and gas is going to be stopped immediately and won't continue uh, to play a substantial role, as it will in the energy economy up to 2050. No one is saying that oil and gas will not continue over a period of time, and no one is saying that existing fields in the UK that we have at the moment will not continue to produce and contribute their products uh, in the future. And there will be jobs uh, in that uh, continuing uh, North Sea oil operation. But it's a one-clause bill with effectively two sections in it. And one, the first section, ostentatiously requires the Oil and Gas Authority to do what it is already doing. Uh, and indeed, the Honourable Member for Angus 
uh, and indeed the member for Brighton Pavilion, uh, reminded us that uh, the Oil and Gas Authority has been carrying out regular licensing rounds uh, uh, every 18 months since uh, 2016, and of course uh, they are required to do that because they are under the uh, requirement of maximum economic extraction. All that is already in legislation, and the Oil and Gas Authority is already doing that. And the second um, section setting out an entirely bogus climate test, which by definition cannot be failed. And that's achieved by skewing the test conditions uh, to test UK gas production emissions only against aggregate LNG imports, which are overall likely to be dirtier in production than UK gas, and not against pipeline delivered gas, which in the case of our main import of Norway is half as dirty in production as, the, as is in the UK. And there is no emissions test for oil, despite it constituting 70% of North Sea fossil reserves, 80% of which we've heard is shipped and refined overseas. But for oil, there is a net importer test, which requires the OGA to issue licenses if the demand for oil and gas products in the UK is greater than production, when this has been the case in the North Sea for 20 years, and no, pressed, no prospect of reversal. A bill built on completely bogus premises. Uh, uh, I'm grateful to the honourable gentleman for giving way. Um, he's talking about bogus premises. He just suggested uh, that uh, we could get more pipeline gas from Norway. Uh, does he uh, not recognise that if we do not produce as much gas as we can from here, it will not be gas from Norway that we can access. It will inevitably come in the form of LNG with higher emissions. So will he please, for the benefit of the House, step up and be honest. We do not have the option to have massively more gas from Norway. If we did, we'd have done it already. Well, I think I'm going to get injury time for that. Um, the, if the Minister had been listening to what I was saying, what I was stating is that the bill, in a very bogus way, has deliberately sidestepped the issue that we have gas, which is much cleaner than ours in its production, available for import, which we should be using as a test, whereas the only test that was carried out was uh, LNG, and which, which conveniently is a little bit more dirty than the gas that we produce in this country. But the bill, the bill uh, is not about what it says as much as what it does. And uh, as indeed the former energy minister and the author of the government net zero report, the former honourable member for Kingswood said recently, the bill goes against everything the UK is saying internationally about moving away from oil and gas and has already damaged our international stance by appearing to double down on precisely the thing we are saying uh, the opposite to on the world stage. And as the, as the Honourable Member for Reading West, in a courageous and precise speech, I thought this evening, uh, the former President of the Glasgow COP uh, said, indeed, it puts into legislation something that already happens under the agency, as I've mentioned, to the OGA, and he stated its sole purpose is to double down on more oil and gas, and nations across the world will not take this very kindly as far as our commitments are concerned. Indeed, the OGA itself uh, emphasised uh, that the bill, it said, is not necessary but would significantly challenge one of the tenets for the OGA to decide when to run a licensing round, whatever the position of the North Sea objectively. The, o the OGA will be forced to scrape up at least a licence a year forever. We know that the claim that this would somehow do something for energy security is also bogus. As the honourable, uh, right honourable member from Maidenhead recently said, new oil and gas licences only provide for energy security if all that energy is sold into the UK and actually it will be sold on the world market, a point a number of members, honourable members have made this afternoon. This whole thing appears to have come about as a result of a wheeze cooked up by a couple of strategy advisers over a heavy lunch to put the opposition on the wrong foot, or another way of putting it, the right side of history. Yeah. But which, quite honestly, should have been put down as soon as the effects of the heavy lunch wore off. <laughs> but instead, the wheeze has persisted through the corridors of power and has finally made it to the floor of the House in the shape of this completely risible bill, yeah. the contents of which have evaporated on the first examination by anybody as to its serious yeah. purpose. Now, that says rather more about the state of government than anything else. Yeah. Where were the control quality controls on policy making? How has something as evidently content free and fact averse as this piece of legislation <laughs> ever made it so far? 
And how did present depart departmental government ministers, whom I have a great deal of respect for, allow it to happen on their watch when they must know it as a load of hokum with no policy merit at all, but which they are now forced to go out and try and justify to this House today. It's a very sad reflection, frankly, on what a tiny, bitter and sad space the government have retreated into, where serious policy development in the energy sphere, and God knows we've got enough of that to be working on, gets replaced by such ill-advised emptiness. And that is what this bill is in the end, just empty. If passed, it will linger on the statute book for a short period, it will make no difference to anything in the meantime and will be rapidly overtaken by the reality of the forward march of decarbonisation in energy. But it will have one lasting effect, as I've mentioned, and that is that it signals strongly, and I'm afraid potentially lastingly, that the, the UK is not serious about its climate and net zero ambitions and is prepared to say duplicitous things on an international and a national stage. And that's bad news for all the genuine work that has so far been done by the UK in net zero and climate leadership. This bill won't stick, but that charge might. And for that reason, if for no other than the many reasons that have been put forward today, it is best that we take this bill no further than the second reading and refuse as a House to let it pass to further stages today. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, may I begin by thanking uh, colleagues from Reading West, Waveney, Murray, Stoke-on-Trent Central, Banff and Buchan, Broadland, Chelmsford, South Dorset uh, for their contributions to what has been an interesting uh, debate. Um, of course, the UK is uh, the global climate leader, and it has been under this government that that position has been secured. How is that to be measured? Do we have objective metrics? Of course we do. The central challenge is to reduce emissions, and this country, under the Conservatives, has reduced emissions by more than any major economy on earth. And how have we done that? Has it been an accident? No, it has not. It has taken the absolutely awful situation we inherited. We heard from the uh, uh, member for Clenethley uh, on her time in government, which she talked strongly about the work they did on renewables. Well, it didn't add up to much under her and the right honourable gentleman. Renewables was less than 7% of our electricity in 2010. Less than 7%. Now it has been transformed. Coal in a further ghastly legacy from the party opposite. Coal, the dirtiest of fossil fuels. We hear so much piety from the party opposite. But what was their performance in government? I'll tell you what their performance in government was. It was failure. Nearly 40% of our electricity came from coal as recently as 2012. By October of this year, it will be zero. And so it is this party, this government, which has stayed laser-focused on delivering climate leadership. And it is in that light that this legislation comes before the House today. Now, why is that? The, the uh, uh, opposition minister asked, why, why, why have we brought it here? Well, the party opposite and the Scottish National Party yeah. and, of course, the Liberal Democrats say we must have no new licensing in the, old, in the North Sea, even as our production is expected to halve over the next decade. It will, despite the fact that if we fulfil, which we will, our world-leading ambitions for 2030 and 2035, production of oil and gas in the North Sea will fall even faster than the country that is decarbonising more than any other major economy on earth. That is the reality. That is the context of this bill, which brings in annual licensing. So the party opposite is going to support oil and gas jobs. It is, just not in this country. It, because not having, not having new licences here will make no difference to our consumption, no difference whatsoever. What it will make a difference to is how much we have to import, and our import dependency will go up. And worse than that, for those of us who care about the environment and to put in its place the pieties we've heard from the parties opposite, what, what, we, what, we, what, uh, what is worse is, and this, and the right honourable gentleman knows this to be true, yep. and members of, are on the opposite side of this House, some of them know it to be true, it will actually lead to imports with higher emissions than production here. It will, it will worsen our ability to move to net zero in the short term. And that is not to mention the 200,000 jobs supported across the country, yep. 90,000 plus of which 
are in North East of Scotland being abandoned by the Scottish National Party. So, they, so, so we are going to take product. So we, we, it will make no difference to our consumption. It will make no difference to world consumption because we are net importers. We aren't spilling our products onto global markets. Our oil, for instance, which um, uh, uh, the Honourable Lady for Brighton often mentions, is refined in Europe at European refineries, and it, it is then turned into products that we can use to bring here. It contributes directly to European energy security and to UK energy security. So the impact is that we have higher emissions if you oppose this bill and you allow no new licensing. You will not see the investment we are seeing in new um, projects like Rosebank. What, it, what is the carbon footprint of the product from Rosebank? It is expected to be much lower than the average across the North Sea and lower than that is expected globally. So again, not only does closing off licensing mean that we will import more, it means that we can, it will get in the way of the investment and the transformation of, the, uh, of our basin. I happily give way to my right honourable. Very grateful to the Minister. As someone who wants to see far less imported LNG, can he give us some good news on what we might be able to achieve in terms of getting more gas out? And will he ensure that it's not just one block that's put up for a licence round, but many blocks to get rid of that LNG? Well, I thank my right honourable friend for his question. The estimate from the NSTA is that a billion barrels of oil uh, equivalent, including gas, would be lost if we didn't have new licences. That is lost tax revenues for this country. I haven't, as well as the 200,000 jobs and lower emissions, I haven't so far mentioned the tens of billions of pounds of tax. It's not surprising, given how comprehensively it is easy to destroy the arguments from the party opposite, that the right honourable gentleman keeps up his constant chuntering. He can't, he can't win the argument while he stands on his feet, so he has to sit there and try and interrupt those who are making it. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, we're talking about a system which will, if, if we don't have new licensing, which is the policy of the party opposite, we will see emissions in the short term go up. We will see uh, 200,000 jobs undermined. We will see tens of billions of tax not brought into the public exchequer. And, and for, for those who again care about uh, dealing with the climate emergency, we will lose the very engineering skills and talent we need to retain in this country in order to make the transition. I will try to respond to a few of the points made by colleagues in the time I've got. Um, and, and my, my hon. Friend, the member for Waveney, um, highlighted the commitment of oil and gas companies to net zero. And, I, and oil and gas businesses are funding clean energy work. We had the honourable gentleman opposite uh, pick on one, and it turned out they are investing heavily in our clean energy transition. Um, we had the uh, member for Murray, uh, who was talking about fighting for those 90,000 Scottish workers. The, uh, the member for Clenethley, I've already mentioned, and her uh, uh, rather risible attempt to suggest that Labour had any sort of record on renewables. Stoke on Trent Central um, emphasised the importance of oil and gas workers to CCUS, which is absolutely essential. Uh, and the, uh, the member for Banff, Banff and Buchan uh, talked about uh, you know, that we are reducing production at twice the rate required internationally. And that is true. That is why new licensing in the oils in the North Sea is in fact fully aligned with net zero and those emissions are part of that. The member for East Lothian uh, talked about oil and gas being essential to deliver renewables um, and supported uh, new licensing and I thank him that for, for that. Um, the member for Broadland talked about what we use is what counts and that's so true. The focus the most important thing is to look at demand, and it is removing and changing the vehicles, the factories and the homes so they no longer use oil and gas, which is absolutely uh, central. The member for Chelmsford quite rightly um, said how important it was that we present this policy correctly. And of course, if, it, if we only had the party opposite playing a proper and honest part in that, we would be able to champion the tremendous performance that this country has made in tackling uh, uh, climate change, and I really do appreciate the speech from my right honourable uh, friend. Uh, the member for Warwick and Leamington talked about the zero homes standard, the importance of improving the insulation and 
uh, energy efficiency of homes, quite rightly. That is why this Government went from a terrible position where we came to power of just 14 per cent of homes having uh, decent insulation, EPCC and above, to above 50 per cent today. And the member for East Antrim, who I disagree with fundamentally on net zero, but uh, correctly highlighted uh, that uh, uh, we will be just sacrificing well-paid jobs without making any difference to our emissions, apart from putting them, apart from putting them up. And no, no. no. Uh, uh, wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. I speak first. Point of order, Barry Shearman. Madam Speaker, I've been in this House longer than most people, and it is the courtesy of the House, in a, in a winding up, to give way in an even-handed way. This Minister has given way over there, refuses to take any intervention on this side. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for that point of order. It's up to the Minister to whom he decides to give way. It, it, it would be it, slightly more usual for him to give way to people who have been here throughout the debate. Um, however, it is up to the Minister to decide. And I really don't like points of order in the middle of winding up speeches. Minister. I, I thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And you're, I, I, the, the, Madam Deputy Speaker has given her guidance. She has given her guidance, and that is those who have been here for the debate, not Johnny come lately to come in and want to usurp it. And, uh, uh, my, the honourable gentleman, I will finish. The honourable gentleman, the member for East Antrim, also highlighted a really excellent point about the hypocrisy and humbug, which is absolutely central to Labour's response to this bill. And that is, if you look, if you look, Madam Deputy Speaker, if you look, Madam Deputy Speaker, if the honourable gentleman who has hardly been here will sit down, I will fortunately be able to come to a close. If you look at the amendment. If you look at the amendment to the bill put forward by His Majesty's opposition, it suggests that by maximising the falling production from the North Sea, it will put us at greater mercy to petrostates. So clearly and obviously an untrue thing that I, I would hope they would hold their heads in shame. That has been at the heart of the opposition's approach to this, to this bill. This bill is designed to send a signal to the industry that we have their back. This bill is all about ensuring that we get to net zero in the most efficient, effective manner possible, and it will underpin this Government's continued leadership on climate for now and many years to come. And I beg to move to this House to support the bill. Well, that was lively. Right. <laughs> Now I've got your attention. Um, I do want to emphasise how important it is for those who have participated in debates to get back in good time for the wind-ups. Please, when they're coming early, just keep an eye and make sure, because people who have participated will be mentioned in the wind-ups, and it is courteous to be there to hear them. Uh, I will take a point of order, Barry Sherman. Could I just make it clear to the House that you know, I wasn't here for the main debate. I came for the wind-ups. I was chairing a committee looking at the future of hydrogen, and I'm sorry to the House that I was delayed. Thank you. I thank the uh, honourable gentleman for that clarification, but it is nevertheless true that it is up to the minister to decide who he wants to call or not. Right. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> Um, the original question was that the bill be now read a second time since when an amendment has been proposed as on the order paper. The question is that the amendment be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. no. The question is that the amendment be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. no.
tell us for the eyes. Tell us for the eyes, Kim Ledbetter and Mary Glendon. Tell us for the nose, Joy Morrissey and Mark Jenkinson.
The eyes to the right, 209. The nose to the left, 292. Thank you. The eyes to the right, 209. The nose to the left, 292. So the nose have it, the nose have it. Unlock. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. No. Division, clear the lobby. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Country, no. No. Tell us for the ayes, Joy Morrissey and Mark Jenkinson. Tell us for the noes, Kim Ledbetter and Mary Glyndon.
Lock the doors. Order, order. The eyes to the right were 293, the nose to the left were 211. Thank you. The eyes to the right, 293, the nose to the left, 211. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it, unlock. Programme motion to be moved formally.